That's crazy. Okay, it looks like all systems are go. We can lift off. Uh, welcome everyone to the fourth evidence-based practice colloquium. Um, I'm going to introduce our Dean, Dr. Dean Gloria Donnelly, who's going to welcome you. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Evidence-Based Practice Colloquium, which is one of my favorite events of the year. And I'll tell you why. In 1955, Virginia Henderson, how many of you know Virginia Henderson? Uh, uh, Virginia Henderson was uh, really a, a thought leader in nursing. She wrote a medical surgical book. She was very uh, prominent when the journal Nursing Research first came out, which was, I think, 1952. So we've only had a really prominent, focused research journal for less than 100 years, which in a discipline is a very short time. Virginia Hendrick, and when nursing research was first published, many of the articles were about what nurses perceived or what their attitudes were, or um, uh, people would measure how far the nurse walked from the nurse's station to the linen closet to whatever. It was really not about what nurses did and what effects they had on patients and what hunches they were following to improve care, it was sort of like studying your own belly button. And so Virginia Henderson wrote an ed a very famous editorial. Actually, I'll send it to Al, and he could distribute it to uh, all the graduate students. It's only one page. And she said, look, folks, we have to stop this. And we have to begin studying the effect that nurses have, or the effect that their ideas, or their changes in care, or improvement in care, or their hunches about what we're doing that might not be effective. That's what nursing research really is. The problem is focused around the patient or around the student, if you're an educator. Uh, and we should be reporting evidence about what we find. And when I look at the list of presentations today, I know that Virginia Henderson is smiling down at us because you're really focusing on important clinical problems and trying to gather evidence that will point uh, practice in certain ways. And then there's a presentation on moral courage in nursing. We're, who's doing that? Is the moral courage for good? Good for you, because we need more of that with all this bullying and, and lateral violence and all of that, uh, those issues that are going on. So we need a blend, but I, I think it's really, really interesting that this group of presentations has focused on clinical evidence. And that's what's going to improve the healthcare system, that's what's going to create better outcomes for patients, and that's what's really going to move the nursing profession forward as we uh, get more and more nurses uh, doctorally and masters prepared. So I hope you enjoy the day, I know I will. And uh, Karen Holt is here from Alaska, which is why it's snowing. Uh, it's not snowing in Alaska, but it is here, and that's specially for Karen. Thank you. OK, 
Okay, so let's go over um, some housekeeping chores. First off, there's a committee that puts this all together. Uh, Dr. Karen Holt chairs it and Dr. Jane McCarthy are two of the key people that move it. But would all the committee members serving on this committee stand up? And I know Karen's going to formally thank each of you probably at the end of the day. But just stand so people can see you if they want to. Uh, we have Dr. Alice Poise, Lou Bennett, Kristen Altafir, Karen. Dr. Jay McCarthy, myself, Wayne Miller is also key to that committee because he's the one who organizes all our events. And then Linda Wilson's the one that worked on the contact hours. And who did I miss? Yeah, Dr. Alice Poise. Yep. I thought I said it, but maybe I didn't. Okay. All right. Um, the other thing I just want to say before we start, as we go through the presentations today, Dr. Jay McCarthy is going to be the moderator. This is being webcast to our channel partners. Drexel has over a thousand channel partners with Drexel University online and there are about 61 people who are on a webcast hearing the entire presentation via webcast. So if you have questions or comments you must use a microphone or the moderator is going to have to repeat it into the mic so that they can hear us. Okay. And with that, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, and I am going to read her bio, which is in your booklet. Uh, Dr. Karen Holt was appointed on September 1, 2011, as the first director for faculty development and online quality within the College of Nursing and Health Professions at Drexel. She is noted for producing innovations within the college to ensure that quality online education offered in the college is indeed quality higher education. She initiated Quality Matters reviews throughout the programs in the college as well as working on the university-wide online learning council to help develop the same quality across all the colleges within the university. Dr. Holt is a certified Quality Matters master reviewer. She has developed other initiatives within the college which have resulted in a cohesive, coordinated, and targeted new faculty orientation program. Dr. Holt has received distinguished national awards for her pre presents nationally and internationally as an invited speaker on the topic of online learning. And she also is a certified nurse midwife, so she is an advanced practice nurse as well. Please welcome her. She is known as the guru in um, evidence-based practice. She's the one that has designed our courses. Everyone, and I am glad to be here from uh, sunny, warm Alaska these days. So I'm glad that I could share my snow with me with you, um, because Dr. Donnelly had it exactly right. We've had exactly 0 0.019 inches of snow during the entire month of January in Fairbanks, Alaska. It's still minus 20 degrees, but we just don't have the snow except for what's left over in November and December. So it's it's not necessarily what we like. So I'm glad to be here and enjoy your snow. <clears throat> so evidence-based practice, it is, um, you're hearing two terms now, evidence-based practice and evidence-informed practice, right? So I'm going to kind of talk to you uh, and ask for some of your interactions, so feel free to interact as you like to. So you hear two terms, evidence-based practice and evidence-informed practice. Those of us in our northern neighbors, like Alaska and Canada, use the term evidence-informed practice to intimate evidence-based practices, which is more what we are seeing in the United States and the UK, which are the seats of evidence-based practice with the Oxford Center, CEBM, that you see in your courses in 503 and 330 at Drexel, and what uh, most of our hospitals channel partners are using the term evidence-based practice. So I want to talk a little bit about the two. What are the differences between them? So let's start with the definitions when we talk about what is the difference. So evidence-based practices and programs are consistently and repeatedly demonstrate desired, desirable outcomes through scientific research methods. That's what we call our evidence-based programs. You can tell that comes from the United States, right? Because they're very specific. All right, so then when we talk about evidence-informed practice, it's saying that it's a practice that is guided by theory with practitioner wisdom and findings from basic research. Now, it sounds similar, right? And they're still saying we're using research methods, but it's the nuances that are different, 
different between the two. So I call that out to you because they don't mean exactly the same, but sometimes we say that they're the same. The evidence-informed practice are concentrating on written guidelines. They're using a strong logic model and a history of demonstrating positive results are present. So you're consuming the research that's out there. In the same way, we consume research rather than produce it in evidence-based practice. So if I had to say one thing, that's the thing that I want you to remember. We have become consumers of research in evidence-based practice rather than producers, which are our researchers. So just to be clear on those definitions, I wanted to come back through. So what are the differences? So evidence-based practice is grounded in positive outcomes. We, we obviously can have negative outcomes, and they can teach us as well. And that we are discovering these through scientific research. That we really underlying both is that we want to come back to our scientific research. In evidence-based practice, the outcomes may be grounded in rigorous evaluation as well, evaluation research. So in evidence-informed practice, we're guided by research rather than grounded, and the evaluation but does not require necessarily the same rigorous evaluation or scientific research. It is still scientific research, and it is still rigorous, but it gives us a little more wiggle room, according to our friends in Canada. It allows more flexibility in implementation, and it allows more innovation because it is a bit more flexible. And then those of you uh, have been through the evidence-based practice, all the things that you're going to hear me saying at the bottom of the slide, you'll see my resource that says, so that's not my own idea, but that is what the literature is saying. So that's one of those best practices that I'd like you to see. So what are our goals with evidence-based practice here? Well, uh, and we're talking about clinical. You see a lot of our talks today are going to be talking about clinical implications because that's what we do. We want to influence the way that we practice. We want it to be the very best way that it can be for this time. Does that mean 10 years from now it's going to be the best way? Probably not. That's what allows us to go back and look at other things, you know. Uh, 60 years ago, we had a bedpan which was, you know, four inches tall, and that was all there was. And then 30 years later, we have another kind of bedpan called a fracture pan, which is graded. And so it's not four inches tall on every end, so it's easier to use. So that's an, an example of how in clinical practice, we can make changes over time. We want to promote health communities and populations. We're talking about population health now. We are talking about what's happening at the bedside, what's going on in your individual practice at your facility, but we're also talking about population health. We want, as the, as the United States, to uh, encourage people to stop smoking. So that's an example of population health. So we're really trying to move evidence-based practice now into a global arena, particularly talking about population health issues. We obviously are going to improve clinical practice, and that's what you're seeing today, because that's how we first jump into it, is improving yourself first, and then it's the ripple effect, right? Then you move outward. And of course, we don't want to forget our outcomes, whether it is improving care, whether it's cost effectiveness, which is one of those outcomes that you found in the Melnick Pico question. We'll talk about that in just a second. And we want to be cost effective financially and with our resources, numbers of people, numbers of supplies. And why? Because we're going to be accountable. We want to ensure accountability for what we're doing. We want to be transparent in how we make our decisions. It's not just my idea of what works best or this one researcher's idea of what works best, but it's a culmination. We're going out to inculcate all of this information, pull it in together, and then it's your job as that evidence-based practice consumer to put that all together and synthesize that information into a logical choice using that logical methods. Similarities, we're going to support high quality, good practice or best practice in, in, in our implementation program. So it's not just this is somebody's pet project that they want to do, but it's why do they think that? Why do they think that we should switch from drug A to drug B when we're trying to do whatever it is we're trying to do? Why are we doing that? Or why do we use this program or that program? In our educational context, why do we use this textbook over that textbook? Is it just because that's what somebody wants? Well, it probably started with that's what somebody wanted, but there is a logical reason why that person wanted to choose that textbook instead of another. So when you can articulate those reasons, then you know you're getting there. 
We want to ensure that the financial investment in the practice is backed by the evidence. We want to promote the development of a culture of quality improvement in programs, practices, and services. So I kind of like the way that sounded, that it's not just your individual practice, it's not just the practice at your facility, and it's not just the practice in your region, it's not just the practice in your state, it's not just the practice in the United States, but it, it is a global issue. So that the ripple effect can be as big as you want it to be. You can start small, because that's where you are and it will grow. So stay with it, find the evidence. Maybe you decide you wanna switch sides instead of just consuming research, you're gonna produce some research. That comes out of being a great consumer of evidence-based practice as well, but it is a different side. And services, the services are what we provide to our patients, to our clients, to our world, to our profession. So, the textbook that we use in the graduate program is um, Evidence-Based Approaches to Practice by Vern Melnick. She came from uh, Poland, actually. I met her on a trip over there one time, <clears throat> and her parents were both born in Poland, and she was going back uh, to visit them, and she was a coal miner's daughter. So that's the, this picture, and that's what I wanted you to see. She is now working uh, at the University of Ohio. Before that, she was at Arizona State, and that's where she made her big impact and wrote her book with uh, Ellen Finout Overholt on evidence-based practice. She was a pediatric nurse practitioner before she uh, became interested in this. The reason I tell you all this is sometimes when you know the person behind the author that you've been studying, you can view her in a different way and all of a sudden you have similarities. The PMPs in the audience can say, oh, she's one of us. And she's interested in asthma and childhood asthma studies. And then the researchers can say, oh, but she's a qualitative researcher. So I'm trying to find and show you that these are common ground. It's not something high in the sky that you can't relate to. These are real people that have come up with some really great ideas. And I want you to take them seriously and really just kind of deconstruct them, take them apart, and don't be so fearful that, oh my goodness, it's research. Because it's really, you can do it. You can do it. That's why we're here. So Bernadette Melnick had a daughter, and this is how she developed her, her ideas about evidence-based practice before the word was coined by Archie Cochran from England. She has a daughter named Kaylin, and they went to Australia for a vacation. It was a 24-hour flight from the United States over there, and in about 20 hours, her daughter woke her up uh, on their plane flight and said she wasn't feeling well, she had a stomach ache. And the mom said, well, Bernadette Melnick said, well, it's all right. Um, you know, just go back to sleep. You, know, you have a little bit of a fever. You're a little warm, but it's okay. So Bernadette Melnick went back to sleep on the trip. And uh, by the time they landed four hours later, she was, the daughter, Kaylin, was white and pale, diaphoretic, and throwing up. So Bernadette Melnick, the nurse practitioner, thought, uh-oh. I think she might have appendicitis. Let's see about that. So they checked into the hotel and then immediately went to the local emergency room where they spent about 10 hours and were turned away and said, no, she just had a stomach virus. It was a long flight. Go home and rest. Go back to your hotel room. So they did. And over the course of the next day, she continued to get worse. Her fever got up to 104. And um, Bernadette Melnick decided that wasn't enough time for her to fly another 24 hours, hours back to the United States where she was comfortable in her own health care. So she had to go back into the Australian health care system and present to the emergency room again, which she did. And after about four or five hours there, she finally convinced them that she really did need an x-ray and she needed to get a CBC. She did get the CBC, but they said there was not a need for an x-ray that really hurt. She didn't so there was not a need for them to look any further. She did get the CBC, but her she had an elevated white count. By this time, her temperature is 103. So you're thinking, wow, we would do it differently over here, right? So if you're looking at objective data, so you start thinking, what am I going to do with this? That's where Bel Bernadette Melnick is coming from and saying, well, that's the signs are not, I, not only am I a mother, and I know that this is not right, and I know that I should not just be giving her Tylenol, which is what the emergency room was doing. So finally, it was a teaching hospital, and there were a lot of residents coming in and about and around. And finally, the uh, attending came through. And when this attending 
came through, he, she, Bernadette Meldick said, well, I, I really think that we need to do more than this and, and really was not successful. And the attending kind of listened to it for about two or three minutes and said, no, your, your daughter is fine. You just need to take her home. You're just an American that is very worried about something that's not really happening. So a nurse came in, Australian nurse came in after that, having heard all of this. And she was actually on duty the day before when she had presented to the emergency room the first time. And that Australian nurse put a piece of paper into Bernadette Melnick's hand, which was the name of another physician. She called that other physician, but she couldn't say it on duty. So Bernadette Melnick took that information, called the physician, asked the physician to come and see them in the emergency room, which he did, which they were paying out of pocket for. And that person took one look at the daughter, ordered the x-ray, another CBC. Now we have a shift to the left and we have a definite pattern. And then off she went to the OR and her appendix had already ruptured. She spent four days in the hospital on antibiotics and then their week in Australia was over. So they were discharged from the hospital and came back to the United States. So the end result of that story was is you can make a difference and it was Bernadette Melnick who started thinking about why we need to have objective evidence behind what we're doing that influences care. And you do sometimes have to stand up and say to the establishment, wait, stop, look at this. That's, this is, that's her example of what started her road of developing this Peacock format. So what exactly did she come up with? Well, we have a population, the patient, that's the P part. Who is your patient? What disease are you talking about? What, what's the health status? Age, race, sex, that can all be in your population or your patient problem that you're thinking about. What's the intervention, the I? What, what are you gonna do? What do you plan to do? What are you looking at? What is the thing that you think is gonna make a difference? How did you come up with that hypothesis? Did you look in the literature and you see that there's other ideas or did you just come up with that idea on your own? Sometimes you're gonna find if it's a very new drug and you wanna be the first one out and you wanna do a PICO question on that and guess what happens when you go to the literature? You don't find anything right because it's still too new. We are consumers of research, not producers. If you are a researcher, you could certainly research that. But if you're trying to consume research, you do have to wait until you get that research out and published so that you can then grab it and be able to change practice. We are the translators. We are going to translate change into our practice. That's our power. Comparison, what's the alternative plan? So now you have this idea for your intervention. What are you gonna compare it to? No treatment at all, this versus this. A different type of plan. Outcome, what is your overall aim? Sometimes you don't know what that overall aim is, so then you need to go back and really think about your intervention again. So you do have to have an overall aim. It's not just let's see what happens. And time frame. Time is the one you can either have a PICO question or a PICOT question. So the T is soft, according to Bernadette Melnick, and she says sometimes you have a time frame on your PICO question and sometimes you don't. If, time, if you have a time-limited intervention, then, um, then you have a T. But if you are not time limited, if it's not important that this medication be administered 30 minutes after you eat, for example, and you're not looking at does timing make a difference, then you might not have a T. You may just be looking at cardiac interventions, dietary interventions. All right, so I'm going to start actually with step three because I think I've kind of gone over step zero, one, and two, that spirit of inquiry that you heard about. And I'm doing this, let me stop for just a second, and some of you are thinking, well, why is she going over this? We heard about this in the class. And I am because I want to tell you that this conference this year, we have some um, participants that are not familiar with Melnick. So I'm giving you a little bit more of a background so you know we are using Melnick's rating scale for this particular colloquium. There are several others that are well known. We have the CAST program, I'll show you that in just a second, which comes from our buddies in England and the UK. And then we have the USPS, US Preventive Task Force, that has its value in, that, in uh, another type of format as well. So we are choosing to use Melnix, and it's coming from her Peacock time frame and her Peacock schedule of questioning, and that's what this is. So I'm just trying to give you an idea of where we are. We have in the audience today, both online, thank you all very much for being for coming today, 
And we have in the audience <clears throat> people at the undergraduate level, people at the graduate level, and people who are not in school. So welcome to all of you. So that's why the long introduction into this. So step three, now that we've come up with your PICO question, is we want to conduct a, a critical appraisal. And we want to do it fairly rapidly because we've got this patient here that we've got to figure out what to do with. So we want to go and we want to figure out what are valid and reliable studies. Not just any study. We're going to do a search. But how are we going to decide which of those studies are valid? Which ones are reliable? We're going to evaluate those ones that we call keepers. How do we decide what are the keeper studies? And then we're going to synthesize this information, put it all together, inculcate, inculcate it from the keeper studies. And when you take the course, that's actually what you're going to get lots of experience doing. But that is our, that's how we're doing this, and that's how we can have confidence that the answer that we come up with from the literature is the right answer. That's how we know that. Is there enough valid and reliable evidence from the search to make a recommended change in your clinical practice? If there is not, I hope you would say exactly that. Well, I only see one or two studies. That doesn't make me feel very confident to make this particular practice change. Now, consider if you're making that practice change in your own life, whether you want to take, say, Tylenol instead of ibuprofen for your uh, ills, that's one or two studies might be okay for you. That might be a confidence level that you can take in your own life. But would it be one that you would make a uh, protocol change on your unit? Or that you would go talk to your uh, practicing body to say, let's make a change in, in how we do, how we treat this guideline on um, pain? Probably not. You would want it to be on more than one to two studies. So that illustrates hopefully an exaggerated view of what I'm talking about. Remember, the level of the evidence Plus, the quality of the evidence gives you the strength of evidence, and that's what gives you the confidence to stand behind what you're saying. This is the answer. I know it's the answer, and I'm confident of it. So when we talk about levels of evidence, in a quantitative sense, we have sort of a pyramid that gives us this strength to stand on what we found. So at the largest bot at the bottom level is our largest group, and that's evidence from let's see if I can read it over here, expert committees from the opinion of authorities and or reports of expert committees. So those are the ones that you can see are a little bit softer. They're not strong evidence. We have a lot of it, but an expert opinion is not based in research methods. So while it is valuable, you can see that it's not as high on this level of evidence. If we have evidence from one single descriptive or quantitative study, that's the next level up. And there's level one through seven, and that's how we identify it. This is a level one <laughs> evidence. When you look at the, at the United States Preventive Task Force Evidence-Based Practice, it reads, this is, guideline is a level one. This guideline is a level four. And the higher the level, one is the highest, the higher strength that that evidence came from. So um, three, all the way up and at the very top is your systematic review and your meta-analysis. And why are they at the top? They're at the top because they are a combination of multiple, and it can be thousands of studies that come to one conclusion, that are combined in a different way statistically, or maybe they're just combined for a systematic review. That's the difference between a meta-analysis and a systematic review that's going to give us the strength to say, we can think that this is the right answer, and this is why. It's a numbers game, right? All right, so if the answer is yes to your PICO question, you found what you're looking for, you're going to integrate that evidence with your clinical expertise. Because remember, back when you were coming up with the clinical question, there was some reason why that was a niggling question. Those of you who have been through your research classes, when your instructor asked you to come up with an idea, you didn't just pull it out of the air. There was some reason that you thought that was very interesting to you and that you wanted to study that. It was probably because you had the idea that this might be better than that. So that's where this comes in again. So you're still using what you know as a nurse to be good things. Now you want to just show it from the evidence. So you evaluate that outcome of your practice change. And if it's positive, continue monitoring that, quote, best or good practice. 
Number six, disseminate the outcomes of your evidence-based practice change, and hopefully that's what's happening today. So you see us all getting together. We have some wonderful posters around the room, and that's what's been done. So if you're interested in those topics, even if you're not interested in those topics, you might get interested in those topics. It's really great, because somebody else has already done all of these steps that I've just talked about to prove that that is a really awesome way to go. All right, so if the answer is no, then you're gonna keep generating enough internal evidence through an evidence-based practice implementation outcomes management project. Why didn't it work? What's going on? What was the problem? And so then you might go down to the next step that says, all right, what more information do I have? How do I need to tweak my PICO question? How do I need to go back to the literature? What's wrong with this? So it doesn't mean it's a no and let's just move on to the next question. It means let's dig a little bit deeper and figure out what is the problem? Where did this go wrong? All right, this is the cover, obviously, the orthopedic uh, nursing, and I just wanted to highlight to you that the slide is really blurry on my end, maybe it's my glasses, but maybe it's blurry for you too, but this was uh, the highlighted article in the orthopedic nursing journal this past year that came from a student who presented last year at our colloquium, so she made the cover page, and it actually had attached CEUs to it, so when you finish with this course and you want to get published, we want to help you do that as well. That's what she did. So there's one example of a great outcome that came out of our colloquium, and that is a way to disseminate your great outcomes. Um, that particular study was done by Sarah Suggs, and it was the use of transexamic acid in joint replacement surgery. Um, and that's what she did. So that's what you are capable of now. You have the knowledge, and you have the ability. So tell us what we can do to help you. And you see that she not only got the cover, but she also got a CE test out of it. Um, also, two years ago, we had Kimberly Morrison come, and she spoke to us about IV catheters and how often we need to replace them. And you can see that she got the cover of World Views on Evidence-Based Nursing, which is Bernadette Mellon is the editor of that. So we are very proud of her as well. <coughs> So we have some good outcomes that are coming out of what we're doing. So I encourage you to keep doing this. So our schedule today has changed a little bit. So I'm going to talk about that for just a second to say our very last presenter is not able to come because of the weather. So we, we're, we're going to probably make our presenters a little bit longer as we go through the day. We'll have more time to ask questions. We're not in a hurry, okay, as we go through the day. The next thing that's gonna happen at 10 a.m., we have Dr. Alderford, who uh, is on faculty at Drexel, is going to come and talk to us about the evidence on safe and effective practice of nurse practitioners. And then after that, we're going to be followed with our student presenters. And I want to tell you that we have several student presenters who are in our RN to BSN program and in our ACE and co-op program. So they're not all master students. So we are very proud of that to say that we're going to cross our, our spectrum here. This just gives you a hint for those of you who like to know what's coming ahead uh, online. I know you're not able to see the schedule uh, in the room, so that's why I put these slides up for you. So who's in our audience today? Just to make it sure that everybody knows, we're talking to Drexel students. We're talking to um, some research 504 students. We're talking to our online channel partners. We have Drexel alumni that are joining us via the webcast. We have some Drexel nursing grant participants and our continuing nurse education program attendees. Thank you all for coming. And now we're gonna do something fun. Uh, this is just a reminder. What do I know about this patient? I want you to kind of think of this in your head when you're looking at your patient and you're thinking, what do I know that I should do about this patient and what am I asked to do? What do the orders say? What does uh, standard practice say I should do? And you come to that decision that what you think might be a little bit different from standard practice, how do you get to that decision? It's that uh, moral courage that we'll be talking about later. 
So given the totality of this patient, not just what they're presenting with, what is the best evidence for this case? Now, right, we've heard that for 20 years in nursing. This is not new. This is the same thing we've been taught in nursing school of why you take a complete history when you're talking to that patient. Uh, you look at all of your data, you're interpreting that data in the context for which it is given, and then you think about your judgment and then you act so that you slow down and you look at all these things, not just what someone else has gathered, but the data that you're looking at yourself. We're providing individualized care. Not all Coca-Cola looks the same, right? So if you have a 50-year-old, 54-year-old person who's riding a racing bike at 10 miles an hour and she runs into a tree and her helmet splits in half, she has no loss of consciousness, and she gets to the hospital and they say, well, you're 54 years old, we're gonna put you on a falls prevention program. Does that make sense? Right, that's using your protocols. It probably doesn't fit that scenario, so that's that example to illustrate that. That's actually a true story. Um, do you evaluate that person for closed head injuries? Everybody in the audience is saying yes. Distance folk, are you saying anything? Not yet. All right, feel free that if you have any questions, distance folks, you can, uh, Alice Poise, Dr. Poise is manning the, your chat, so she will put your comments in, and you can also email them to drexelce, ce at drexel.edu, when shaking his head, ce at drexel.edu. All right, so what they did is they said that she did not need to be monitored for a closed head injury because she had a helmet on. So because she had a helmet on, she probably, and she had no loss of consciousness, so she probably didn't have a head injury. All right, so a year later, this same patient has lost her job. She uh, has little short-term memory, but she has normal long-term memory. Bottom line is, a year later, they did do an MRI and found that she indeed did have a coup de coup head injury and had not been treated for a year for that closed head injury. Uncertainties and contingencies. Is my, patient, is my management of this patient focused on the patient? Does it take that patient into consideration? Perhaps the uncertainty of science is inherent. We do always want to think about what we're doing. Should we use evidence-based practice as patient-centered rather than population-centered? That's what you're gonna see in the literature these days. I said at the beginning of my talk that we do want it to be population-based. That is being talked about in circles. I'm gonna use it patient-based when I'm treating the uh, patients for which I provide care for, but I also am gonna talk to you about population-based health. So I, I would contend that you can do both. What's CASP? Those of you who uh, know that I like technology, I take my evidence-based practice with me on my phone. And I have this app that's free in both the Android store and the iTunes store called CASP. And this is what it looks like. Um, sometimes you forget what is a case-controlled study, and so it's gonna give you the definition. So it has all the definitions of all the things that you thought you were gonna remember, but you don't because you're not in the research all the time. So you're at the bedside, you're nervous, you're getting ready to do a presentation. You can pull up that app and there's your definition right quick. The other thing is it gives you the, those quick index card of information. Okay, how am I gonna decide is this a keeper study? How do I decide that this is a study that I should really look at or is this after reading the abstract, that's that rapid critical appraisal? Nope, I need to get rid of this one. So you take this application, pull it up, and there's your questions that you can answer very rapidly. I answer them in about three minutes after I've read the abstract, and that tells me whether to keep going or move on. Keep going or keep that one. So if you want more information about what I'm going to tell you now from King Charles, who was king of England in 1685, there's the website that you can watch this on your own. So this is not my own information, but I've collocated it from the um, internet. So King Charles was a happy-go-lucky guy. In fact, uh, the Springer Spaniels, Char the Char King Charles Spaniel was named after him. He was an animal lover. But he uh, had sort of a wild life. He liked his rich food and he liked his wild women. And he did some things that were probably not very good for his health. 
So in an evidence-based practice way, what happened to King Charles? We're going to look at it from the lens of evidence-based practice. And these are older slides. So they, um, on Monday, which was the day he got sick, they let, and that's the word for drained, cut, 16 ounces of blood. Now just for those of you who aren't used to thinking in ounces, a unit of blood is eight ounces. So there's two units of blood right there. Cupped means they took it out, decided he needed to be bloodlet. So they uh, took two ounces, two, eight, two units of blood. Then they applied heated cups to his skin, which formed large round blisters in the, in, to stimulate his system. Definitely would stimulate his blood flow, right? The, the blood flow that he lost. So now he has burns where they have blistered him. Then they decided he wasn't getting better, so they needed to let out eight more ounces of blood. So there's another unit. Now he's three units down. Then they decided, okay, we need to purify his stomach, and we're going to do that by inducing vomiting. All right? So that didn't work as well as they wanted to, so now they decided to give him an enema. All right, can you imagine? He must not feel very well at this point. All right, so then they decided, well, that's not quite enough, so let's have him swallow a purgative to clean him out. So the enema wasn't good enough, and they induced vomiting. Well, maybe there's more left, so let's do this. Then they left him, then they... Forfeited? Forced fed him. They, oh, great. So they've emptied his stomach. Now they're going to force feed him a syrup of blackthorn and rock salt. <laughs> so now, can you, can, you, can you see this? He's hypovolemic. They're adding salt directly to his stomach by force feeding him. So that must mean he didn't want to eat it himself. And he's missing some blood. And so he has diarrhea and he's throwing up. Man, that just doesn't sound very good for medical treatment. Then they decided they should shave his hair and put blistering plasters on his scalp. Actually went back and they used a mustard preparation, so it probably didn't smell very good as well. So now he has burns from blisters from the, from the cups, and now he has burns on his head from the plaster. We're still on Monday. So the king regained consciousness. And his treatment seemed to be working because he regained consciousness, so they decided he actually is getting better. Now, while this sounds far-fetched, and it's certainly not today's medicine, how many times do we try a treatment and say the next day, oh, they got better, so this must be good? I don't know why we think that, but they got better. It may not be because of our treatment that they're getting better. That's the exaggerated point that I'm making for that. So since they kept at it since he was getting better. So they gave him another enema. Then they applied hellbore root powder up his nostrils, more blistering plasters to the skin, and powdered cowslip flowers to his stomach. Special plasters were made from pigeon droppings were attached to his feet. After 12 hours, they put, they left him alone. So now we're on Thursday. On Thursday, because of his treatment, he was near death. I'm not really sure how they determined he was near death, but they did. The king was blistered again, rebled, repurged, and given another enema. I can tell you the rebled, they took two more units out. So I added it up, and at this point, they've now taken a total of five units of his blood, all in the space of Monday through Thursday. He was given a Jesuit's powder, which was a controversial malaria, did have quinine in it, remedy. And they, la they laced it with opium and wine. I'm kind of glad they gave him a little bit of opium. <laughs> Saturday, he was dead. So we don't want that to be our story. We want to make sure that what we're doing is evidence-based. And that's why that is not evidence-based. <laughs> I hope you all enjoyed that story. Are there any questions? No. Well, we're not going to treat the king like that. So thank you all very much. And I'm going to ask Dr. Jane McCarthy to come up now. And she's going to open our colloquium with our student presentations. OK. 
Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Holt, very much to help us get oriented here and be thinking about evidence-based practice and not be doing what happened to the poor king there. We've come a bit of a ways there. Um, you told a wonderful story to make your point. So uh, our first speaker this morning is our faculty. So for this was the first year that we opened up uh, our colloquium to faculty, and we were fortunate to have Dr. Christian Alvaroff, who's been ha helping us in, um, with the colloquium this whole year. You know, we start working on the next colloquium as soon as this one finishes. So we meet throughout the year to, to make this all happen. So Kristen helped us with that. And um, Kristen actually finished up her doctorate, her DNP at the University of Maryland, which is where I taught also. So it was nice to see um, her work there. And, and that's what she's going to present to us today was her, her um, doctoral capstone project. Um, so, but just a little more about Christian is she's an assistant clinical professor here in the College of Nursing at Drexel. She got her nursing degree at Penn State in University in 06 and her MSN is a, she's a pediatric nurse practitioner. So you sort from of, Drexel. At, from Drexel, you did your PNP. So um, in 09. She was awarded the Outstanding Nurse Practitioner Award in the Pediatric Track here in Drexel. And as I said, she completed her DMP at the University of Maryland, which is online primarily, right? You had to go down there. Not anymore. Not. Well, now it's online. But at it was hybrid. It was hybrid. It was hybrid. Mm -hmm. That's right. We went down there every semester a little yes. bit. Yeah. Um, okay, so, and her focus was on um, evidence based health policy. So today she's going to tell us about how she used this principle of evidence-based practice in health policy in, 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 in helping to move the legislation forward mm -hmm. and implementing legislation so that um, we can see, to have nurse practitioners increase their scope of practice, basically. Right. So uh, let's welcome Dr. Alvin. Thank you, Jane. So to start off, the title of my presentation, um, Implementing Evidence-Based Health Policy, and it's a focus on Pennsylvania's Nurse Practitioner Full Practice Authority. So after hearing Dr. Halt speak, I would say that this would be more implementing evidence-informed health policy. And this really takes us away from the traditional evidence-based, evidence-informed practice. Because I'm not really talking about the traditional patient outcomes, clinical outcomes. This is stepping outside of the box and really thinking what we can do as nurses, nurse practitioners, nurse anesthetists, midwives, um, beyond the hospital, beyond care of the patient. So the reason I became involved in health policy is I, like all of us, we go into nursing because we want to make the biggest impact we can for our patients. I never thought I would be active in health policy, but then I took a step back and I really thought, hmm, I kind of like this health policy elective in my doctoral program. And it really showed me that I can make the biggest difference by changing policy, because that indirectly affects our, well, long-term directly, affects our profession and it affects our patients. So that's how I got into this. So what's the background? So for this project, if you look at the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, it increased health insurance to an estimated additional 32 million patients across the country. In Pennsylvania alone, it increased 600,000 patients in Pennsylvania related to the Medicaid expansion. So these patients now have health insurance in Pennsylvania and they didn't previously. Why is this such a big issue in Pennsylvania? Because two thirds of primary care physicians are not accepting Medicaid patients. So who's gonna fill this gap? Nurse practitioners. 
So there's a scarcity of estimated 45,000 primary care physicians in 2020. This is a big deal. So in 2013, we, as in the Pennsylvania Coalition of Nurse Practitioners, we came forward with legislation like many other states and we tried to pass Pennsylvania's Nurse Practitioner Full Practice Authority Bill. What does this mean? This would remove the collaborative agreement with physicians. Um, the Institute of Medicine's Future of Nursing, the scope on, or the focus on scope of practice. This talks about how advanced practice nurses should work to the full scope of their education and training, and that the barriers need to be removed for us to care for more patients. The literature, when we talk about evidence-based practice, the literature is a huge thing. There are over 100 studies out there that demonstrate that nurse practitioners provide the same, if not superior care to our physician colleagues. There are higher patient satisfactions and there's also more cost savings than our physician counterparts. So this is proof alone that we need to push this legislation and improve our practice. It also increases access to care if this legislation is passed. Unfortunately, in 2013, the legislation was held at a standstill in committee. So the way the legislative process works is legislation is introduced, then it goes to the committee. We introduce the bill in the Senate alone. Um, so it did not get moved out of committee. It needs to be moved out of committee before it goes up for a vote in the House or the Senate. So my project, the purpose of my project was to use evidence-based health policy tools and work with the Pennsylvania Coalition of Nurse Practitioners to advance this legislation. Because as I said, it will allow nurse practitioners to work to their full scope of their education and training. And it would improve access to health care for our Pennsylvania patients. 21 states within this country, including, including the District of Columbia, have already passed this legislation. And there are numerous states that are currently going through the same process as us in Pennsylvania. So what, being a DNP, what was my first step? It was to look at the evidence. So for me, the evidence was doing a thorough literature review and also speaking to other states. What have other states successfully done to implement their legislation? The big things, previous, um, or sorry, building relationships, be prepared, evidence-based tactics, and use using um, technology and the media. Previously, when we tried to pass the legislation in 2013 that did not advance, we focused more on the traditional aspects of lobbying and health policy implementation. So lobby day, writing letters. And this time, with our legislation that was introduced, 2014, 20, or sorry, sorry 2015, 2016 legislation, was really looking at the literature, pulling everything we can, and going full force to have this legislation be implemented. So when we talk about building, building relationships, this doesn't just mean building uh, relationships with our policymakers, but it also means building relationships with fellow advocates, building coalitions with nursing organizations, becoming the experts in something. So nurse practitioners being an interest group that when our policymakers who really aren't that well versed in health policy or in healthcare a lot of the time, that we are their point of contact so that we can educate them, make them more informed on the decisions that they're going to make that affects our profession and also our patients. For us to be prepared, we need to be politically savvy and really understand the policy and political process. One of the big things that really is probably the keyest thing that are the largest thing that is evident in the literature and from other states is having a strong unified voice with a concise, consistent message. If we are not all speaking together, our whole point is mute. We need evidence-based focus. So this means taking that literature that shows that nurse practitioners are have high standard of care, the patient outcomes that we deliver, and really share that with our policymakers. Use the statistics, use the facts to push our agenda forward. Use the science, bless you, in our policy. 
Nowadays, we're fortunate enough that we have technology and media to really make our point known. So that's what other states have done. That's what the literature shows. Use our media, use Facebook, use Twitter. Use emails if we cannot write handwritten letters. Use phone calls if we can't go and meet the um, legis legislators in person. But it should be noted that our in-person meetings really do still have the highest effect. So here's the literature. There are numerous, as you can see on this slide, overlapping ideas. All of these ideas weren't just within one study, but overlapped throughout the whole literature review. So what did we learn from other states? The reason I focused on Nevada, New York, and Minnesota, although there are 21 states that have passed the legislation and the um, District of Columbia, is because these three states have a culture that's the most similar to Pennsylvania. They had the strong physician opposition that we are facing, and these legislative battles were led by nursing organizations, just like in Pennsylvania. So what did I learn from Nevada? Nevada said that we really need to focus on our key priorities for the legislation. They also talked about establishing a champion within the House and the Senate. So this time around, we took that um, evidence and we are introducing the bill in both the House and in both the Senate. So we have a champion in both, Representative Toppler and Senator uh, Patricia Vance. Um, hiring a lobbyist. We have two incredible lobbyists that we have hired, and we are working with other nursing organizations across the state. We have a clear, concise message, which I will talk to you about further. So that's from Nevada. In New York, in 2015, 20,000 nurse practitioners will now have full practice authority as of 2015. So they used a lot of grassroots efforts. They also brought forward that sometimes within this legislative process, you need to strike a compromise. So they talked about how they have a compromise for 3,600 hours where nurse practitioners have a collaborative agreement, and then after that, that original period, they have full practice authority. Minnesota, Minnesota said, do not allow the opposition to divide and conquer. This is huge and one of the big points that we are focusing on this time around. So we are trying to build credibility as a nursing profession when we are working with the legislators and really speaking the truth to the legislators about all of the research that's out there to overcome the opposition. We also are now using Facebook, nice and strong. In Minnesota, they had 15,000 likes when their legislation was passed through the Senate, and we are doing a great job of using Facebook as well. So if you look at this pretty little map in the corner, you can see these are the states that now have full practice authority. Those are the green ones. The yellow ones are states that have um, reduced practice, so that would be the ones that went for a compromise, which is not the worst thing for states to do because it still loosens the reins on the majority of nurse practitioners. The red are the restricted practice states, as you can see, a lot of us. So what's our PICO question? My PICO question is, does evidence-based health policy tactics help advance Pennsylvania's nurse practitioner full practice authority bill? So I looked back at the literature, and my next step was the design. So this is not a research study. I am not creating new evidence. I am using the evidence that's already there as a DMP. So this is a quality improvement health policy intervention. My sample was the Pennsylvania Coalition of Nurse Practitioners. So that is 1,500 nurse practitioners that are divided across 18 regional groups within the state. Statewide, we have a representative, bo represent, representative body of 8,700 nurse practitioners. So this whole setting, have, what will this affect? All of the nurse practitioners in Pennsylvania. 
So House Bill 765 was introduced in March uh, 2015. Senate Bill 717 was introduced in April of 2015. And as you can see, this time around, we use the companion bill. So if one gets passed in one chamber first, then it'll switch over to the other or vice versa. So we also have something that we developed called the campaign committee. So the campaign committee, we invited um, representatives from each different regional group across the state and we have phone conversations at least once a month and this was a way of creating a concise consistent message that each group each representative will report back to their um, regional group kind of as the representative we created a leadership group. We have a president lobby firm. We have Kaiser Media um, and myself. So we have tons of grassroots, grassroots efforts that we worked on, which I will talk about. And then we also had a lobby day. So this is the traditional um, health policy implementation. And that was back on May 12th, 2015. So to go back to our policy implementation strategies that were in the literature, we really used every single one of these key points to move the legislation further. So originally, the project started out with, I will just create a whole campaign manual for each of the regional representatives. But I took it a step further. I created that into a PowerPoint. The PowerPoint was then presented, I presented it to every regional representative across the state. And then within each of their meetings, they presented the PowerPoint to everyone within the group. So as you can see, here is a map of Pennsylvania Coalition regional groups, and you can see each little division and how many nurse practitioners across the state, the same consistent message was presented to them. So 16 of the 18 regional groups had the presentation presented. Um, it ranged from 9 to 103 nurse practitioners at each meeting with a state total of 547 nurse practitioner attendees. So all of these nurse practitioners definitely had the exact same message. I cannot account for all of the nurse practitioners who the presentation was emailed out to. Um, I can only estimate that it would be much higher than the 547. The other thing we really did was one of the key things in the literature, one of the key things from other states that we've learned was build coalitions. Coalitions are huge. So organizations, they really can help activate memberships on their own. So AARP is one of our huge coalitions. They have outreach to so many different um, individuals across the state of Pennsylvania. So they push our message forward through them. Um, it also shows when, it, when there is a specific organization that's pushing the legislation, it makes it more personal to all of our policymakers. So within coalitions, we have six coalitions currently. The nursing organizations would be the one, the National Nursing Centers Consortium. We have numerous community groups, the Pennsylvania AARP, the Commonwealth Foundation, and the Bucks County Women's um, Advocacy Coalition. We have healthcare organizations. We have the Pennsylvania Rural Health Association and Geisinger Health Systems. Um, the Pennsylvania Hospital Association, previously they were against the legislation, but we are swaying them more. They are past neutral and they are um, hopefully soon going to come out as a supporter for the legislation. What does that mean for us? That means that once the hospital association says, yes, we support this legislation, that other hospitals will hopefully start coming on board and feel comfortable saying, yes, we support this legislation as well. So the social media, the um, care, hashtag care for PA is our hashtag. We are active in Facebook. Um, we are active in Twitter. And there's also a YouTube channel for us as well. 
Nurse practitioners across the state have had numerous grassroots efforts. If you could see that picture on the top left, that is my hand against the mailbox of our legislators in Harrisburg. You can see how small those, that mailbox actually is. So whenever you are being active in health policy, you can see the benefit of handwritten letters. It is easy to flood their mailbox. It speaks a lot when we do that. So I know it takes extra time to write handwritten letters, but if you want something done that's really important to you, please take the time to do that. Um, within Drexel, Dean Donnelly was kind enough to sponsor a bus that took students, so my nursing students, to lobby day to kind of close that health policy gap because there really is a gap between nursing and health policy. It seems like such a foreign thing, but it's not. All of the legislators are normal people. They look at us as the experts. So whatever your interest is, please take a step in becoming an advocate for your patients and the profession. Um, so there's a whole list there of individual grassroots. I'm not gonna go into it for the sake of time. So 227 nurse practitioners and students attended Lobby Day. Senator Vance is um, our champion in the House. You could see her right there. Last week, Senator Vance, the media asked her, what's on your bucket list before you retire? Because she's retiring at the end of this legislative session. And she said her bucket list, the biggest thing, is for this legislation to be passed for nurse practitioners. How was I able to track my project. So originally, originally when the House bill and the Senate bill was introduced, we had 15 sponsors and, um, in the House and 10 in the Senate. I am now proud to say that in the Senate, we have 21 sponsors. And in the House, we have 50 sponsors, which is huge. So our legislation, after the budget is worked out in Pennsylvania, we have enough support for this legislation to be pushed out of the Senate committee. We have enough support in the Senate that it should be voted and passed through the Senate. Um, most likely there will be a compromise on this legislation where, uh, based on experience, so hopefully, fingers crossed, we could build the legislation to say that there should be mentoring hours instead of a collaborative agreement. So mentoring hours would mean that we can have like the state of Maryland where nurse practitioners can have a mentor that's a nurse practitioner instead of a physician. So that's our goal. After it comes out of the Senate, then it'll be flipped over to the House. And within the House, with 50 co-sponsors, we are going strong in that sense as well. So what does this mean for you? What does this mean for health policy in general? It means that we all need to use evidence-based or evidence-informed strategies to implement and evidence-based to show to the legislators why our issue is so important. This model isn't just for nurse practitioner legislation. This could be for any nursing legislation that's out there. It could be translated for all of us to push our issues forward and make a difference. The goal of all of this is to close the nursing, the nurse practitioner, any nursing policy gap and to have us all be more active. Um, the big part of this project was knowledge dissemin dissemination to nurse practitioners. This is so important because we are the front line of the legislative battle. We're the infantry in this whole race. It's also important for what we do in Pennsylvania for other states to use us as an example. What can they do to pass their legislation? So lessons learned, what have I learned throughout this process? That nurses are powerful, we're passionate about what we're doing, and really we aren't gonna stop until we are doing the best we can for our profession and for our patients. I've also learned that when you take the literature, when you use evidence to inform or um, 
to educate our legislators, that's when we have the strongest impact. So what was done with the last legislative session compared to now, it has made a huge difference. When I went to Lobby Day, I can also say that it was pretty humbling to see the noise that nurse practitioners can make, any nurses can make in the legislative process. Another thing I learned, within nursing, our PAT, which is the Political Action Committee, the money that we, do, we donate is nothing compared to physicians. The American Medical Association donated $1,936,000 to PACs within the election, $19 million, $650,000 were spent on lobbying alone in the 2014 federal election. Of the top 20 medical contributions to PACs, totaling $69,988,900, $933, only one of the 20 was a nursing organization. Do you guys know what that is? Anesthesia. anesthesia. So thank you, anesthesia. You were number nine. The American Association of Nurse Anesthetists was number nine. So we all need to follow in your footsteps. So here are all of my references, numerous slides. I'm happy to email them to anyone. Thank you for everyone's time and any questions? When's the vote? Well, it depends when the budget goes through. It's currently on hold. Um, I know that Governor Wolf just requested, just pushed through the budget, um, a, a proposal, a proposal for the budget. So we'll see how long that takes. We've been waiting since the fall for it really to be pushed through. The governor is in our support. We missed your question. Oh, I'm sorry. The question was, when will the vote be and where does the governor stand? Okay. So we're waiting for the budget to go through before the Senate will, the Senate committee will uh, pass our legislation through uh -huh. and Governor Wolf is in support of our legislation. Oh, good. I was thinking that also, but if there are questions out here, good, we've got a question. Just wait until we get a mic to you because we want the other folks to hear. Hi, I have a, a couple of comments. I'm Dr. Kathy Ann Selmy and um, I'm Assistant Dean of Accreditation and Regulatory Affairs, so there might be some policy implications in that. And also, I've taught nursing 527 and 504. And if I've had any of you, please introduce yourselves because I know you, your voice so well, I just don't know who you are, your face. Um, I have a question for the speaker, and by the way, that was excellent. Really excellent presentation. Thank you. Let's, um, give, let's give our speaker a hand. <laughs> When you said there's a shortage of 45,000 physicians in, uh, is that all 50 states? Correct. Okay. Uh, secondly, based on my experience, and we've all had uh, experiences and conversations with our physician colleagues over the decades, um, the one um, bullet point that you made that two-thirds of um, physicians do not accept Medicaid payment. That's, if, if we visualize a pie of patient um, activity and patient encounters, that means two-thirds of those patients can't be seen by physicians that they may want to be seen by. Those physicians, and, and this uh, is unfortunate, but I can testify that I've been told this, uh, may not want a piece of that pie, and they don't want you to have it either. And that, that's unfortunate, but I think that's a compelling piece of evidence um, when we are talking to people that there's two-thirds patients that aren't being seen, that two-thirds of, I'm sorry, I have to flip that around. 
uh, two-thirds of the physicians do not want to see Medicaid patients. So we could go on and say that they could possibly be flooding the ERs, which is a burden and obstructs ER activity for those patients that these the other third physician wants to see. So it's a cog in the wheel of progress because they're getting stuck there. We, we could hypothesize. So that, that's another point I wanted to make. Yeah. My third point I wanted to make is that the Commission on Collegiate Nursing Education, which accredits our uh, BSN and MSN programs and soon, uh, fingers crossed, DNP program, um, talks about the fact that our uh, MSN curriculum should have three Ps. Do you know what they are, students? Physical assessment, pharmacology, pharmacology, and pathophysiology. pathophysiology. And now we have a fourth P uh, that is taking up a lot of conversation at all the professional conferences, and that is policy. Policy is the fourth P, and policy is introduced at the undergraduate level. And we know we, we have BSN students here, or in the BSN students, further developed in the MSN, and then at the DNP level, we actually see implementation and this beautiful presentation that you've done. So it's really important that we're familiar with policy because we're, we're being tasked with that. Uh, as nurses and can effectuate tremendous change as evidenced by this presentation. But another, um, another group that you might want to look into is TANA, which is the American Association of Nurse Attorneys, who are nurses like you and me who've gone to law school. And uh, they may have passed the bar and are Esquire, or they may just um, be a JD and, and not involved in litigation or the practice of law, but doing other things such as administrative positions. But the TANA website is a great source for policy because the TANA organization is very interested in policy making. So I wanted to put that out there. I happen to be a member of TANA, so I know the work that they're doing. Um, but thank you very much. and. <clears throat> I'm glad I'm Thank you here. for your comment. Sure. Um, to piggyback off of that, when we talk about the access to care problem in Pennsylvania across the whole country, 45,000 of these primary care physicians will be decreased by 2020 because they are all aging, they're retiring. In general, physicians do not want to go into primary care because that's not where the money is. Um, another thing, I am so thankful to Dean Donnelly that um, Drexel is in support of a health policy elective that I will be teaching, creating for the first time this upcoming uh, quarter to undergraduate nurses to close this gap. It's even in theory, um, we have the possibility of creating a health policy track for these undergraduate nurses to start implementing these ideas at the first level of education for nurses. So, thank you. Hi, Hi good morning. Uh, my question is, I realize this is probably in the minority, but I'm wondering, you know, you talked a lot about relationship building uh, through policy. Is there any action or effort being put forth with the minority probably of physicians who would see this as a, as a benefit for healthcare and, and where do you see that going? Because I do think there's an opportunity there for the collaboration that, you know, takes place daily, but then could also further that through policy. Absolutely. Um, so as a whole, I can say in every, all the dates are blending together, but we had a hearing within the House, um, within the licensure committee for the House. It was the nurse practitioners, the Pennsylvania Coalition of Nurse Practitioners, versus the Pennsylvania Medical Association. We were supposed to have on that 
on our panel, there were four or five physicians that were speaking in support of our legislation. So there are constantly, all across the state, physicians who are in support of our legislation. Unfortunately, a couple days before the hearing, PA Med came along and said, no way, you cannot speak out against your organization. So they were all pulled from the panel and we scrambled to pull together a group of nurse practitioners um, to have them speak instead. So individually, yes, there are tons of physicians. Uh, my collaborating physician, completely in support. There's so numerous. Um, the majority of physicians who, this is a blanket statement and it's not specific to all individual physicians, um, but it's usually the older physicians who do not work with nurse practitioners that see us more as a threat, if anything, if I can say that in this room with nurses, um, to the physicians. Um, their big push is that we are trying to break apart the team and that physicians should be the head of the team. They also talk about within the hearing, um, and still the legislators do not quite understand this, the difference between a collaborative agreement and collaboration. Nurse practitioners will always collaborate. It's the tenant of our practice. Um, a piece of paper is not going to say that we need to collaborate, because um, we do it regardless. That piece of paper says that there is a physician who we can consult with if we have any questions, but I can tell you out in rural Pennsylvania, there are nurse practitioners who pay physicians money for this collaborative agreement and the physician in four or five years has never set foot in that nurse practitioner practice. So they are not the same thing. So when it comes to discussing collaboration, that's where we as nurse practitioners really need to educate our policy makers on what that means. Thank you, good question. Kristen, just a couple comments. Did you look at the number of physicians when they graduate from med school that actually go into primary care? Um, because the last time I looked at that, it was about 2%. Yeah. It's very low, and there's not money in primary care for right. physicians today, so they're usually going to specialty care, Correct. which also would make the point, because when you look at the Affordable Care Act and where healthcare is going with prevention and the focus on primary care, who's better positioned than, than advanced practice nurses and all of nursing, really, to do right. that? And, um, you know, I think it's just something we really um, need to look at. But one of the things, if you've ever heard of Dr. Tim Porter O'Grady, who's really big into the leadership world, um, he wrote an article when the IOM report came out about the future of nursing, where nurses should practice to the full extent of their practice. And, and he wrote a series of articles in nursing management, uh, four articles, and his first one he ended with, you know, the opportunity is for nurses to really seize the health care of the country. But as usual, will nursing rise to the occasion? And I think what he was trying to say that as nurses, we typically do not stick together. Mm -hmm. If you look at our professional organizations, yes. you know, we need to be involved. It involves volunteerism. But a lot of nurses, like we have over 100,000 in New Jersey, and maybe 5,000 belong to the state professional organization where you can move and shake things. So the reality is there's over 3 million of us Largest provider in the country, yet we don't stand together. And if we did, yeah, we could be on top of the AMA. And Absolutely. that's what we need to push for. Absolutely. And even for things like Lobby Day, which really do, obviously, this is our legislation. It really affects our profession and patients. As nurses, we see our priority a lot of the times with, I can't miss a day from work. I can't leave my patients. Who's going to care for my patients? So that's something that we need to overcome and try and look at the long-term effects of that. And also for healthcare organizations to build in that flexibility for nurse practitioners to be advocates at a larger level. Mm -hmm. um, just, just to um, kind of put a different slant on what Al just said about nurses sticking together. Uh, physicians don't stick together either. What binds physicians together is the referral system and money. And so we need, I think, to craft some arguments that 
take away the economic threat uh, or cast a little light on whether or not there is a real economic threat. When a physician says, I should be the captain of the ship, there's an economic subtext to that. It's not only about being in charge. And I don't think in all of our history, even sticking together on entry into practice and, and education, that we have focused enough on economics because that's what's really driving the healthcare system. And if you look at the Affordable Care Act, it's really an insurance bill. So we need to look at that more carefully and uh, be a little more politically savvy about crafting arguments that allay the economic fears of physicians. And if, if I could respond to that, that what was pointed out here, that those Medicaid patients, physicians don't want to take care of them anyway. Correct. So if we want to take care of those patients, we're not an economic threat. And are we making that point um, at, at the lobbyist? Here's a question here. Hey, good morning. My name's Ali Miko. Um, I'm here representing Drexel's nursing anesthesia program. Great. Um, so I wanted to say thank you very much, Dr. Altdorfer, for your presentation. You're clearly very passionate on the issues, and I think um, the health policy class that you're going to be initiating, that sounds like a great idea, and I'm kind of excited to hear more about it later on down the line. Um, so my question is, Obviously, with Pennsylvania and the coalition of nurse practitioners, it's very obvious that um, the issue of full practice authority is pretty paramount um, for our nurse practitioners in this state and to gain uh, independent practice authority as it is with Pennsylvania um, nurse anesthetists. Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious, um, for future, as you know, as we always know, we should be also looking at what other issues might be coming on down the line in order to be most well equipped to deal with those situations. So I just wanted to um, either get your opinion or if you have any information about what kind of issues or what issue is kind of what's up next um, as we come and tackle this issue because um, I, like you said, the evidence says one thing uh, about patient satisfaction, patient care is equal or superior with nurse practitioners leading the way in primary care. And uh, I also agree with that among nurse anesthetists as well. Uh, there's plenty of evidence that states that as well. So um, just wanted to hear from you on what's up next. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, to be honest, with the Pennsylvania Coalition of Nurse Practitioners, we've been putting so much time and energy in this legislation that this has been our big focus and we'll probably all take a month or two off once it passes to just ah, take a deep breath. But most likely what's going to happen is there will be a compromise on the bill, so that will be our first thing that we'll tackle after this. So we'll pass the bill with the compromise and then we'll go further to get rid of the compromise. That'll be our follow-up. Um, but initially, once all of this talk was happening, we talked about, do we make this an APN legislation? Um, and we're starting with the nurse practitioners, but I would see this as the next step for other advanced practice nurses in Pennsylvania to kind of take this as a leeway of, look, they're doing it. It's working. Now we need to all form together, build coalitions to move our legislation forward as well. Okay, another question. Hi, my name is Susanna Risa. I'm a professor with the Nurse Anesthesia Program. Um, last year, I was president of the Delaware Association of Nurse Anesthetists, and in that year, we were able to get the consensus model passed. And it actually was the last day of session. One bill was passed at 3.39 a.m. and the other one was 4.49 a.m. Wow. So that was like the last day of June. They were going right. to recess after that. So we were able to get it passed. Um, as president, I probably spent the most money than all of the other presidents combined. Mm -hmm. But uh, we hired a lobbyist and a strategist. Um, that cost us $31,000 and we hired them for seven months. 
This process of getting the consensus model passed was a, about a four-year process, and the lobbyist that we hired is Dana's lobbyist, so he knew us, he knew what we stood for, um, and then the strategist that we hired, she's a registered nurse, she's a lawyer, and she was a state uh, representative herself that had since she, went, she didn't run for re-election because she was going to teach at a law school, but she knew all the players. She knew, yeah. you know, everyone that was there, how to, who she could go to to get this passed. So, luckily, especially for me, since I authorized the money, um, <laughs> we were able to get that passed. But it was a team effort, even though we had the biggest, the largest amount of money contributed. The Delaware Coalition of Nurse Practitioners, which has only been in existence for a few years, they gave us $5,000 towards that. That's great. And, that, and what we were told was that that was all the money they had. So it was definitely a team effort. Um, now our big issue is with the VA getting, um, you know, full practice authority, and I think it's the CRNAs that are holding it back for all the advanced practice nurses because, like you said, um, the AANA is ninth, but I believe the first one is the ASA, the American Society of Anesthesiologists. I believe they're the highest pack. So, like, we have one million in PAC funds, and I believe they have over 10 million in PAC funds. Right. So, the point of my rambling here is just to say, you know, support your PAC. Uh, yes. belong to your organization. We're also probably one of the highest organizations with membership. Um, I believe it's about 85 to 90% of CRNAs belong to the ANA. So That's great. Yes. And I can, yeah, no, thank you for your comments. And I can say, unfortunately, with nurse practitioners, we more gravitate to our um, professional, like, specified, like, pediatric nurse practitioners. Like, NACNAP, the National Association of Pediatric Nurse Practitioners. I'm an active member on the board for that. Um, so a lot of people forget that there's more broad organizations that we need to put our money into. I'm not saying everyone give all of your money away to political advocacy, but I'm saying those that $50 a year makes a huge difference. Um, and another, I have more things in my head as far as what we're doing as a plan of um, implementing this legislation even further. It, one of them is huge around evidence-based health policy, and I'm biting my tongue to tell you guys because it's so exciting, um, but it's something we're keeping in our back pocket. So you'll find out about it next year, hopefully. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, just one last thing. Um, the Coalition for Nurse Practitioners may want to consider expanding and uh, revising their name to the Co Coalition of APRNs, Advanced Practice Registered Nurses, which would encompass nurse practitioners, nurse anesthesia, nurse midwives, and uh, CNSs. So you have four groups. Which would make us super strong. Yes. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. I think that's what Maryland's done. Um, that is what Alaska has done. Yeah, and I, 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 to get back to the point of, is this going to be debated yet again on the, on the floor? No. Oh, so we done. have enough support with, it was debated in the House. Okay. Um, in the Senate, we have enough support that okay. there will just it be doesn't have compromise. To because I, like, I know in Maryland, we had a bill with the PA versus the nurse anesthetist and bringing a PA school there. And when you talked about the bus, yes. the day it was debated, uh, Maryland brought a busload of nurse anesthesia students down to the, to the, you know, to the legislators. And that room was packed, mm -hmm. and they just backed down 100%. Yeah, and I can, I can tell you the hearing was public, and the room was open to um, nurses, physicians, anyone that wanted to listen. Nurse practitioners flooded the room. Good. We were shoulder to shoulder. PA Med came in um, like 15 minutes before it was set to start. We were there three hours before. Um, the physicians came in, and they said to the chairperson, um, I think it would be really fair for nurse practitioners to give the physicians this, these seats on this side of the room so that it was even. And I'm so proud of our yeah. group. They said absolutely.
absolutely not first come first serve. So it was really evident to all of the committee members how strong good message good. we had. That's wonderful. Well, let's give Dr. Alder. Thank you very much. Thank you. Come on up, and we're going to get your slides up here. Queen, I might need your help with this. Help with pulling up. Okay. Where he has the. All right. As they're here. pulling up the slides, we're going to do one more presentation, and then. Yeah, we're going to take a break after this presentation. So, boy, that was great, wasn't it? I hope you all enjoyed that. Um, it was a little different from the rest of our presentations, but. I think it was meaningful for all of us in this room. So Shannon Nicosia, she's in a student here at Drexel in the Clinical Nurse Leader MSN program. She graduated actually with her AD degree in, from Penn State in 2011 and finished her BSN up at Penn State World Campus in 2012. She's accumulated a lot, a lot of uh, nursing experience. She's worked as a med surge nurse in a long-term acute care facility and home care and hospice. She's worked there also as a clinical nurse instructor. Shannon has uh, a passion for hospice nurses and uh, nursing and is currently working as a hospice nurse in Manhattan, Kansas. So Shannon came to us today, flew, came here. Did you fly? I hope. Um, I'm actually staying with my parents. They live in Central PA, uh, the State College area. So we okay. came down last night. And you, and you flew in, right? Yesterday. Yes. No, okay. actually, I've been here for a little while. Um, Good. Good. You didn't have to come in. Yes, I've been here a few weeks. All right. Okay. She's originally from Spring Mills, Pennsylvania, but has lived in Georgia and now Kansas. As her, her husband is on active duty. She is a mom of a two-year-old and a two-month-old. So she's going to talk to us about early palliative and hospice care. Let's welcome Shannon Nicosia. Uh, thanks for having me. Good morning. Uh, my name is Shannon, and I will be presenting on the efficacy of early palliative and hospice care. The purpose of my presentation is to describe the evidence on the effectiveness of early referral for hospice and palliative care on improving the quality of life in terminally ill patients. Um, I'd like to start with a little background on why I chose this topic. It didn't take long for me as a new nurse to realize the importance of end of life care. My first, the first patient that passed away um, under my care on my shift was a terminally ill patient and she, her family was going back and forth trying to decide about hospice care. The patient herself was in and out of cognition so she wasn't able to make decisions on her own any longer. When they finally decided, yes, we're gonna go home on hospice, it was too late. Uh, the, the physician that day said she would not survive the transfer home. So that was the first time as a new nurse that I became a palliative care nurse and we started the, med, or the palliative care protocol on our med surge floor um, and the patient died a few hours later in her hospital bed, which I don't think was the death that maybe she would have wanted. Unfortunately, that was, not, that was not the last time that happened. There was many other times that I had a patient whose family or the patient themselves were trying to decide on hospice care and we're in the hospital and they finally decide, but for whatever reason, we don't get them out and getting that quality end of life care that they um, deserve. So that was my first experience as a new nurse um, with a patient passing. Fast forward a few years later, my first death as a trained hospice nurse was an equally eye-opening experience. Uh, this patient was a 30-year-old young patient, mother of two, dying of cervical cancer, and they finally decided to pursue hospice care on a Friday. And I was the nurse on call that weekend, uh, and she passed away on Sunday afternoon. And it happened quickly, and her young children did not understand what was going on. Her husband couldn't really accept the process, and I don't think the patient herself 
was necessarily ready, and as that was my first experience as a new hospice nurse, I don't think, even though she was under our care, receiving hospice care, I don't think that was the peaceful death that she wanted. Um, so, unfortunately, that too is not very uncommon. In our program, we often get patients admitted within weeks, days, or even hours of death. Um, and I can't, you know, as a nurse, I can't help but wonder why are these patients not getting referred to us sooner? Uh, what, are, what are the barriers to this process and how can earlier referrals improve quality of life in these patients? Uh, so back to the purpose st statement, uh, during this presentation, I'll, I'll describe the current evidence on the effectiveness of early referrals to palliative and hospice care. And we'll be comparing the effects of early referrals versus the effects of late referrals on quality of life. A little bit more background on the clinical problem. Hospice and palliative care are widely used end of life care programs with proven benefits and positive effects on clinical outcomes. Hospice care is the most widely used federally funded end of life care program in the United States. According to the 2014 National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization Facts and Figures Report, it is estimated that in the year 2013, between 1.5 and 1.6 million patients received hospice services in the United States. And it is also estimated that in 2011, approximately 44.6% approximately of all deaths in this country were under the care of a hospice program. The benefits to hospice and palliative care are numerous. The, the focus of hospice and palliative care shifts from curing to caring, from prolonging life to preserving quality of life. These end of life services aim to provide expert pain and symptom management, as well as provide emotional and spiritual support. These services can make patients feel less isolated during their last days and they also result in higher satisfaction and outcomes, better outcomes for family members because they can make family members feel and caregivers feel more supported. Hospice care also results in lower health costs, less hospital visits, and a lower likelihood that the place of death will be in a hospital. Now, although these services are very widely used and have many benefits, Referrals to hospice and palliative care often come too close to the end of life. The National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization reported that half of all patients enroll in hospice care in the last three weeks of life, one third enroll in the last three days of life, and 10% enroll in the last 24 hours of life. It is unclear if early referrals for hospice and palliative care improve quality of life for terminally ill patients. Does the timing of these referrals make a difference? So the PICO question used to conduct a literature search on this topic was, in patients receiving palliative or hospice care, are early palliative and hospice referrals more effective than late palliative and hospice referrals in accomplishing the, de the desired outcomes of palliative and hospice care? In discussing the methods of my research, four databases were searched for relevant and current literature on this topic. Uh, the databases were CINAHL, Full Text, Cochrane Library, PubMed, and Science Direct Journals. In conducting the database search, the components of the PICO question, as well as synonyms for the PICO question components were used as search terms. Instead of the terms early hospice referrals and late hospice referrals, often the two were combined into the term timing of hospice referrals. Outcomes of hospice care was used synonymously with the term quality of life, as quality of life is a main established goal of hospice clients. Now, originally, uh, my focus for my search was on hospice care alone. However, limiting my search to hospice care generated too few results, so I expanded the search to include palliative care as well. And if any of you are confused about the exact difference, um, the goals of the two services are the same. The main areas where they differ is care location, timing, and eligibility for services. So 
Hospice care occurs most often in the home or maybe a hospice house, whereas palliative care occurs in acute care settings, uh, hospitals, or also nursing homes. Hospice care, in order to be eligible, you must, be, you must have a terminal diagnosis with a life expectancy of six months or less, whereas palliative care, there's no time restriction. Palliative care patients can receive palliative care as well as treatment. Hospice care begins when treatment ends. But overall, the goals of both services are the same, and my PICO question was focused on how to better achieve the desired outcomes of the two services. So other general terms that were used then include palliative care, uh, hospice care, hospice patients, and improving hospice care. And then the terms palliative care and hospice care were often used interchangeably. And then during the database search, if, if multiple re results were found, there were attempts to narrow the search terms. If few results were found, there were attempts to broaden the search terms. And then some of the databases had filters that I used to narrow down the results. So this slide just includes all of the, all of the keywords and search terms that I used to conduct my searches. So the method of selecting the four best available evidence-based articles from the literature was a process that involved determining the level of evidence, validity, scientific merit, and generalizability of the available articles. It was also determined with each article whether or not it answered the PICO question. And each database searched only articles that were written within the past five years were selected for analysis. The level of evidence for, the, for each study was determined by using Melnick's hierarchy of evidence. And the majority of evidence on this topic falls under a lower level of evidence, descriptive research and qualitative studies. And the reason for this is because when answering holistic questions or topics surrounding issues such as the burden of illness. Um, questions like that, softer topics, are more commonly found in descriptive research. Uh, so although there may be a lower level of evidence, they're appropriate for answering this PICO question. So I ended up choosing two randomized controlled trials for critical appraisal, one retrospective cohort study, and a, a descriptive study. Selected, okay, so I said the selected articles were written within, fast, within the past five years of the literature search. Okay, so the studies. The first article that I analyzed was entitled Early Palliative Care for Patients with Advanced Cancer, a Cluster Randomized Controlled Trial. This study f falls under level two evidence. It was a randomized controlled trial that took place in Canada in 2014. 24 medical oncology clinics were cluster randomized to consultation and follow-up by a palliative care team or to standard care. So the oncology clinics were the units of randomization and the patients were the units of inference and randomization was done in a one-to-one -one ratio. The primary intervention of this study consisted of outpatient consultation and follow-up by a palliative care team. Um, 461 patients with advanced cancer completed baseline measures for this trial and results were analyzed at both a three-month and a four-month endpoint. So 286 patients reached the four-month endpoint. The outcomes measured in this study included quality of life, symptom severity, satisfaction with care, and problems with clinician-patient interactions. The authors stated that quality of life was used as the primary intervention, or primary outcome, excuse me, for this trial because it is a central focus of palliative care. Uh, this study used many different instruments of measurement for the data analysis. Quality of life was measured using the functional assessment of chronic illness therapy, spiritual well-being facet scale, and the quality of life at the end of life, or quality scale. Symptom severity was measured using the Edmonton Symptom Assessment Scale. Satisfaction with care was measured using the FAM Care P16 instrument. And problems with clinician-patient interactions were measured using the Cancer Rehabilitation Evaluation System Medical Interaction Subscale. 
Higher scores on all of those scales represented better outcomes in, for the patients. And so the use of all of these multiple reliable scales did strengthen this study. So the results of this study, um, at the four month endpoint, the differences between the intervention group and, and the control group were significant for all scales, favoring the early palliative care. Uh, further, the results of this study showed improved quality of life and care satisfaction at four months after the start of the intervention, more so than at the three month endpoint. So these findings support early palliative care for patients with advanced cancer. The second analyzed article was another randomized controlled trial that was conducted in Boston in 2010. This RCT was also level two evidence. It was a non-blinded RCT. The article was entitled, Early Palliative Care for Patients with Metastatic Non-Small Cell Lung Cancer. So this study also examined an early palliative care intervention. The sample size was 151 patients with newly diagnosed metastatic non-small cell lung cancer, and the subjects were randomly assigned to one of two groups in a one-to-one -one ratio. Uh, the intervention group of this study received early palliative care integrated with standard oncologic care versus standard oncologic care alone. So data was collected by using baseline questionnaires that were completed at the start of the trial before randomization, and follow-up assessments were performed at 12 weeks after the start of the study. The measured outcomes were a measure of, a comparison of measures of quality of life after 12 weeks. And these measures included assessments of multiple dimensions of quality of life, including physical, functional, emotional, spiritual, and social well-being. The instrument of measurement used to measure these dimensions of quality of life was the Functional Assessment of Cancer Therapy Lung Scale, and the Lung Cancer Subscale was used to evaluate symptoms. Higher scores on these scales indicate better quality of life. Now, mood was also assessed with the Hospital Anxiety and Depression Scale and the Patient Health Questionnaire 9. So the primary outcome of this study was the change from baseline to 12 weeks in the score on the trial outcome index, which was the sum of the scores on the two scales, the functional assessment of therapy, cancer therapy scale, and the lung cancer subscale. So the results, the findings of this study were consistent in showing that patients who received the early integration of palliative care had improved quality of life. A comparison of measures of quality of life at 12 weeks showed that the patients assigned to the early palliative care group had significantly higher scores than those assigned to standard care alone. In addition, the per percentage of patients with depression at 12 weeks or depression symptoms was significantly lower in the early palliative care group when compared to the standard care group. And the patients in the early palliative care group also received less aggressive end of life care. The third analyzed article was a retrospective cohort study that was conducted in the Houston, Texas area in 2014, and it was entitled Impact of Timing and Setting of Palliative Care Referral on Quality of End-of-Life Care in Cancer Patients. Now this was a level four study that documented the presence or absence of quality care indicators in the last 30 days of life of cancer patients, 366 cancer patients that had, excuse me, descendants that had a palliative care referral. So all of, the, all of these subjects had the palliative care referral, and then this study specifically compared the timing of the referrals. So the indicators used in this study included ER visits, hospital admissions, ICU admissions, and ICU deaths. All, like I said, all subjects had the palliative care referral, and early referral for this study was defined as greater than three months between the first consultation and death. And late referral was defined as less than or equal to three months between the first consultation and death. The results of this study showed that early referrals were asso associated with fewer ER visits. It was 39% in the early referral group versus 68% in the late referral group. Fewer hospitalizations, 
48% in the early referral group versus 81% in the late referral group, and fewer hospital deaths, 17% in the early referral group versus 31% in the late referral group. The early referral group was also less likely to receive aggressive end-of-life care when compared with the late referral group. And this study also differed from the rest in that it compared outpatient versus inpatient consultations, where the results show that outpatient consultations were more likely to occur earlier and they were associated with less aggressive end-of-life care. So the findings of this study um, clearly support that there needs to be improvement in access to early palliative and hospice care referrals, as well as the need to improve and increase outpatient palliative care services. The last critically appraised study was a descriptive study that was conducted recently in 2015 in Japan. This study fell under level five evidence. The title of this article was Length of Home Hospice Care, Family Perceived Timing of Referrals, Perceived Quality of Care, and the Quality of Death and Dying in Terminally Ill Cancer Patients. This well-conducted descriptive study involved a questionnaire that was sent to over 1,000 bereaved family members of cancer patients who died at home in Japan. The sample size was 1,052 bereaved family members. So this study was different from the rest in that it evaluated family members' perceptions of length of care, timing of referrals, quality of care, and quality of death and dying. It is the only study selected that assessed factors contributed to the perceived timing of referrals. The results of this study showed that 42% of respondents reported that the timing of the hospice referral was late or too late. The families of patients with care of less than four weeks were more likely to regard the timing of the referral as late or too late. And the results, so the results of this questionnaire showed that family members who perceived the timing as late or too late were more likely to report a lower quality of care and a poorer quality of death and dying. So the results of this study were very thorough and very in-depth, and they very much supported early palliative and hospice care. I think that this study added an appropriately softer element to the process of answering the PICO question with its, with its descriptive nature and bringing in family members' perceptions. Um, this study was able to measure perception, which isn't easy, but it's really important when considering this specific topic. And by bringing in the family members, it included a very important part of end-of-life care. So after analyzing the four best articles of evidence, it's clear that early hospice and palliative care referrals are more effective than late referrals in ensuring quality of life at the end of life. Early referrals are associated with less aggressive end of life care, less depressive symptoms, and overall higher care satisfaction of patients and family members. When hospice and palliative care interventions occur at appropriate times, it's easier to meet the desired outcomes of these services. The evidence supports early palliative and hospice care referrals and highlights the need to increase interventions to improve access to these referrals. And so all of the studies analyze have the same results in answering my PICO question. I will talk a little bit, the four studies were well-conducted studies that answered the PICO question. However, one of the main limitations I would say is that all of the subjects for all four of the studies were limited to cancer patients. So although the majority of hospice and palliative care patients are usually cancer patients, they're, this, these studies, the results of these studies can easily be translated to apply to patients with other terminal diagnoses. Um, the, the goals of hospice and palliative care are typically the same for most patients regardless of their specific diagnosis. So, and the intervention of early hospice and palliative care can be applied to any patient regardless of you know, what, what their terminal diagnosis is. So, Overall, there is a need for more research on this subject, specifically in non-cancer patients. So clinical implications. Evidence shows that early referrals to palliative and hospice care improve quality of life in terminally ill cancer patients. Mm -hmm. 
It is recommended from this evidence that screening processes should be established for hospice and palliative care. And these screening processes should be sustainable across different health settings, including outpatient settings. Screening processes used for referrals should be measurable and focus on identifying subjects with goals and preferences that match the goals of palliative and hospice care patients, of palliative and hospice care programs. The, the screening processes, the goals should align with what the goals of these end of life care programs are. Standards should be established for clinician patient communication and advanced care planning that are measurable, actionable, and evidence based. And healthcare professionals should be adequately educated and trained on facilitating end of life care discussions and decision making. Common barriers to hospice and palliative care need to be removed. So there are a lot of things we can do today as nurses and healthcare professionals to improve the timing of hospice and palliative care referrals. Healthcare providers, nurses, all of us should encourage advanced care planning in terminally ill patients in a timely manner. While it is obviously a very sensitive and delicate subject, it should not be ignored. And the evidence also supports co consistent delivery of person-centered and family-oriented care. And this is something all nurses can do every day. Overall, awareness needs to be raised on the importance of end-of-life planning. Not only should patients and nurses and healthcare providers be educated on end-of-life care planning, but the public should be educated as well. Education on end-of-life issues like this is essential in order to ensure dignity at the end of life and respect. And as nurses, we should all advocate for terminally ill patients and work to preserve their quality of life. Oops. And here are my okay. references. Your references? Okay. Thank you Thank so much. Thank you. Wasn't that great? Wow. Any questions or comments out there for Shannon? Hasn't she done some wonderful work here? I had a question. So, um, so you said federal funds for this. So, are Medicare patients covered for hospice palliative care? Yes, they are. Um, the difficulty with Medicare is, with hospice specifically, is they have to be eligible. So, they have to have that terminal diagnosis and the life expectancy of six months or less. Mm -hmm. So, that can be a barrier to hospice care because. Mm -hmm. Sometimes certain diagnoses, it's hard to say how much longer they have. <laughs> Dementia, for example, um, or Parkinson's. How do you, how is someone made re-eligible if, you know, it's, it's difficult with certain diagnoses. So that, I think, is a major barrier now. Barrier. Palliative care can be received, but hospice care is a, it's trickier. Um, any other comments or questions? Yes. While you're getting the microphone, I'll, I'll uh, jump in there. I had one question. When you're talking about quality of life and quality of care, I think that's broad enough to, to encompass a lot of things. But I wonder if you, in your opinion, did you not find that there were differing opinions or definitions of what was a quality experience? For example, you were measuring uh, in hospital death versus out of hospital death. Right. Some may consider an in-hospital death really what they want, so that right, way we wouldn't right. consider that poor. Yeah, definitely. I think that's one of the reasons it can be hard to research this topic. I think um, there are some that, without a doubt, maybe, for example, pain management or symptom management, I think that is, it is, it is a matter of perception, though. So hospital death, maybe that is what somebody wants. Um, I think it also, the comparison between ER admissions or ICU admissions. That might be something that's more appropriate in, you know, talking about quality of life. But it is a matter of perception and that makes it a little bit difficult to explain and to study. But yeah, like I said, I think pain management, symptom management, I mean that's one of the main focuses as well. So I think you're spot on with education because if we're educating then they can make the choice. Right. But it's about the education. Right. I just wanted to say that I appreciate your presentation because I 
care very deeply about palliative care. I come from an ICU background and it really is not utilized in the way that it should be. But I also think it's important to point out that there is a difference between palliative care and hospice because when you talk to physicians about palliative care consults, I think they automatically assume you're headed towards a hospice route and you're not. You know, your CHF patients, like you said, they will be that, you know, they'll have that illness for a very long time. And if you can introduce palliative care in the beginning right. of that diagnosis, it makes it much more comfortable for families to allow natural dignified death when the time comes because then they can transition to hospice when that time comes. Right. But I think that and you know further research absolutely is needed and I because it does the majority of research focuses on terminal and people cluster palliative care and hospice like they're the same but they do serve similar but distinct functions and I think that's so important because when you're in an acute care setting and you want to do the best for your patient right. as soon as you say palliative care doctors are particularly surgeons are like oh my god Right. You, you don't even, you know, it's like you've said a horrible thing. And so the education of the patient, but additionally, we're going to have to really educate providers because I don't think that even physicians understand the role of a palliative care team. Right, right, exactly. And you're right in saying palliative care can be given during treatment. It's not this is it. It can be symptom management and they're pursuing advanced treatment still. So you're, thank you for that. Yes, you're right in saying that there is a difference and physicians do need more education on, on both services. Anybody else? Okay, thank you so much, Shannon. Great job. She graduated from Rowan University with her Bachelor of Science degree in nursing. She's currently a student in, here at Drexel in the Innovative Innovation and Intra Entrepreneurship in Advanced Nursing Practice Program. She's a certified addiction nurse and worked in the field of addiction and maternal child health and pediatrics for over 20 years. And that kind of tells us her, her interest in this topic this morning. She's uh, worked in the addiction and maternal child health field. She's assisted in the development and implementation of a tool used to identify preg pregnant women at risk for substance abuse in Camden City. So, and that information was used to develop the statewide perinatal addictions prevention project. She's published. And so that explains to us her interest in her, her study today on the use of buprenorphine to reduce neonatal abstinence symptoms. So let's welcome Tony Primus. Thank you. Um, I first wanted to start off with thanking um, 
the EBP uh, colloquium committee. Um, it, it's so important, and I am just encouraged um, as an older student <laughs> that um, we would be encouraged to have an interest in uh, research and um, to help us in this important subject. So thank you so much. Um, I also uh, actually, I don't know if Dr. Holt is in here, but I took from her uh, lecture today the fact that using what you know, and that is also so important because um, I thought about my topic which, and my interest, which is addictions. And um, using what I know uh, in my research paper actually helped me. So um, we'll get started. Uh, I, my thoughts for my PICO question at, in the use of buprenorphine to reduce neonatal abstinence uh, symptoms, I thought about what I know as an addictions nurse and in my practice, what goes on in my practice as far as uh, neonatal abstinence syndrome and the treatment of pregnant substance using women. Um, so pregnant women treated with buprenorphine, I thought it when they're treated with buprenorphine, it does lower the withdrawal symptoms and they're not as severe as the women that are treated with methadone. So I thought maybe it would be the same in neonates. Um, the, I just wanted to give you a little background on the treatment of neonatal abstinence syndrome. And uh, the goal is always to stabilize uh, symptoms of withdrawal and restore new normal newborn activity. Um, neonatal abstinence syndrome is costly and labor intensive. Most neonates that are born to women that are um, addicted to or being treated with methadone or buprenorphine, um, they can have a lengthy stay in the hospital up to a month, sometimes two months, depending on the severity of their symptoms. Uh, and that is in the uh, neonatal intensive care units of the hospitals and also in um, the trans units of each hospital. And those are definitely, they require a lot of care, one-on-one -on -one care. Um, the SAMHSA, Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration, reports that 4.4% um, of pregnant women aged 15 to 44 used illicit drugs. And a 2012 report um, stated that neonatal abstinence diagnosis is 3.9 per 1,000 births per year. So this is what we are seeing uh, across the country. Um, the assessment of neonatal abstinence syndrome is determined by the Finnegan scale. There are other scales out there, but the Finnegan scale is the one that is um, 
recommended by the American Academy of uh, Pediatrics. Uh, the tool is used to quantify the severity of neonatal abstinence, and it can begin as early as two hours of life, and, and they continue scoring every four hours. It depends on your hospital's uh, protocol um, in order to uh, score. Uh, and we'll talk about it in the next slide. Um, and it's used to also determine the initiation of pharmacolo pharmacologic intervention. There can be non-pharmacologic intervention, which they start off with, which is swaddling, rocking, minimal sensory or environmental stimulation, and maintaining the core body temperature. Um, they also alternate the bottle and pacifier during uh, feeding to compensate for the excessive sucking and to prevent emesis. Uh, most hospitals now encourage breastfeedings to help reduce the need for pharmacological intervention as well. Um, and the pharmacologic intervention uh, can include buprenorphine and methadone, although that as well depends on the hospital um, protocol or policy. Uh, some other pharmacologic interventions, uh, the first line was morphine sulfate, but I don't really think they used that as much anymore. Most hospitals are getting away from that, and they are using methadone, which is the, uh, the federal guidelines state that methadone is the approved treatment. This is the modified Finnegan scale, um, and this is what they use uh, to determine whether a neonate would be initi initiated with pharmacologic intervention. Um, it's kind of hard to see here. I do have some extra copies if you're interested, or I can give you the website that you can go to. Um, and as I said before, uh, it is um, recommended by the American Academy of Pediatrics. Um, I wanted to note that although the studies report, um, most studies that, we, that I looked at reported that there's a decrease in the onset of uh, neonatal abstinence signs and symptoms with buprenorphine neonates. So you want to be careful when you're using the modified Finnegan scale because the recommendation in most hospitals is um, that they're scored for four to five days. Sometimes the onset of symptoms in buprenorphine infants does not uh, occur until seven days of life. So. That was something that was noted in all of the uh, research. I'm going to talk about the clinical problem. Um, as I stated before, uh, I gave you some statistics on newborns and um, the newborns that are being treated in the hospitals for neonatal abstinence syndrome. And that has increased with the increased use of uh, opiates. Sometimes that a woman may find herself addicted to opiates that are prescribed, which um, is occurring more and more. And with the pregnancy, she cannot with, um, it's not recommended that you withdraw at that time from opiates. Um, it, neonatal abstinence syndrome is described as a group of symptoms such as irritability, poor feeding, diarrhea, tremors, hyperactivity, and seizures that occur due to exposure to the illegal uh, or prescribed drugs in utero. Um, I always think as a rule of thumb that the withdrawal symptoms in a neonate are similar to the withdrawal symptoms of um, an adult. 
and they have some of the same symptoms, which are uh, flu-like symptoms, um, and it's really, it's difficult to see in a neonate. Um, and it's unclear whether buprenorphine and naloxone is more effective than methadone at reducing the symptoms of neonatal abstinence syndrome. Um, my purpose statement was, the purpose of this work is to describe the evidence on the effectiveness of buprenorphine compared to methadone on decreasing the symptoms of neonatal abstinence syndrome and the hospital length of stay. My PICO question was formulated from um, what I know. <laughs> um, do opiate exposed infants with neonatal abstinence syndrome treated with buprenorphine compared to similar infants treated with methadone have lower Finnegan scores within two weeks after birth? The literature, I looked through um, several databases. The four that I chose were PubMed, CINAHL, Cochrane, and PsycInfo, bless you. Um, and the keywords I used basically were neonatal abstinence syndrome, uh, NAS, methadone, buprenorphine, and um, opioid exposed newborns. The first study that I looked at was Wigand and um, the research article was entitled Buprenorphine Alexone Compared with Methadone Treatment in Pregnancy. Uh, it was a small sample size. It was a level two uh, retrospective cohort study. Um, they used 62 mother neonate dyads, 31 treated with methadone and 31 treated with buprenorphine and alexone. Uh, the results were that the length of newborn hospitalization, uh, the methadone group spent 9.87 plus or minus four days compared to 5.6 plus or minus five days for the buprenorphine group. Um, the percentage of neonates that were treated for NAS in the methadone group were 51.6, and within the buprenorphine alexone group, uh, 25.1. Um, and the peak NAS score, scores were lower in the buprenorphine alexone group. Uh, and the neonates were treated with buprenorphine, that were treated with buprenorphine and alexone had shorter overall hospital stays. The second um, research article was uh, by Galima in 2012. The differences in the profile of neonatal abstinence syndrome signs in methadone versus buprenorphine exposed neonates. Um, this was also a level two study of evidence, double blinded, random, randomized clinical trial. And that was a little larger with 129 neonates born to opioid dependent women that were receiving either methadone or buprenorphine treatment during pregnancy. Um, the, there were three analyses conducted, the incidence of the total uh, NAS score, the mean severity of the total NAS score, and individual NAS signs uh, compared between medication conditions. And um, they did a two-way analysis, uh, or ANOVA, and the medium time treatment initiation compared to medication conditions. Um, the results were that the mean severity of total NAS score was uh, significantly higher in the methadone uh, versus the buprenorphine exposed infants. The third study I looked at um, was the Jones study. It's referred to as the mother study. It's um, maternal opioid treatment uh, human experimental research study. 
And um, an interesting side note to this study was that um, all the other studies that I um, looked at and researched referred to the mother study in their um, body of evidence. So it was a pretty important study. Um, it was a level two randomized double blind clinical trial and there were eight clinical sites. Um, the mothers were between 18 and 41 years old and they had to have a current opioid dependency and they had to have a positive uh, opiate urine. There were some exclusions um, uh, as a result. But um, the results, the neonatal outcomes, um, I specifically looked at the neonatal outcomes. In this study, they also looked at the maternal outcomes as well. So um, the global hypothesis was that the buprenorphine produced better outcomes for peak NAS scores and the number of neonates requiring treatment, the amount of medication to treat NAS, head circumference, and length of hospital stay was decreased with the buprenorphine um, exposed infant. And the last study was another Galima study. <clears throat> she also worked with Caroline Kahnbaum, who is known um, within this, uh, the addictions field for her research uh, at Jefferson. Um, uh, it was also a level two uh, retrospective comparison study, rather small. Uh, the medical records for 75 neonates exposed to buprenorphine or methadone uh, in utero who required treatment for NAS. The results were as well that the median time to treatment st statistically significantly uh, they were significantly lower in the buprenorphine group compared to the methadone exposed neonates. The synthesis of evidence, um, the evidence from the two randomized clinical trials and the two retrospective studies consistently found that the buprenorphine group of neonates had shorter overall hospital length stays. The clinical implications for this, um, the evidence from these studies found that there were less frequent neonatal abstinence syndrome, lower peak neonatal abstinence scores, and shorter overall hospitalization for the neonates whose mothers were treated with um, buprenorphine or naloxone. And from this evidence, it all of these studies recommended the use of uh, buprenorphine be considered to treat opioid exposed neonates. Um, the American College of, uh, uh, the American Congress of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, or AGHOG, in a 2015, uh, one of their uh, papers, I'm sorry. <laughs> supported the use of buprenorphine uh, as medication for pregnant opioid dependent women in treatment. Currently, it is not um, federally approved as um, treatment for pregnant women. Only methadone is federally approved at this time. Um, some external factors to the research <laughs> was that um, things such as legislation, regulations, and standards within, health, within each healthcare institution uh, could limit the recommendations because of the FDA classification of buprenorphine. It's currently considered a category C. Um, I was encouraged to, to um, hear the speaker talk about legislation and how nurses can become more active and advocate for our patients. Um, because things such as the FDA classification is something that um, we need to look at for the treatment of uh, neonates in the future. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any questions? 
for Tony. It's a very interesting study. I hear what you're saying that this drug, what kind of a drug is it? You didn't tell us. Buprenorphine? Bu right. Um, well, they talk about buprenorphine and naloxone, but only buprenorphine is used for um, pregnant women at this time. How does it act? Do you know? It's a, um, it's a partial agonist antagonist. Of, okay. Okay. Of an, uh, uh, okay. Um, but it is FDA approved. It's a it's drug. It's FDA approved. But, but not, not for, for this indication. Women. Yes, not or for this. Or for pregnant women. Yes. What's it approved for? It's approved for um, helping with withdrawal oh, symptoms. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Op specifically opioids. So it could be used on the neonate. Yes, it has been. It's yeah. okay to go ahead and use this on the neonate. I mean, this evidence to me is very strong evidence that yes. this is more effective than the methadone. It is. I and if it's FDA approved for this indication, I mean, the, um, anyway, I see with this evidence, it, it could be an educational effort to yes. get out there and tell providers that treat this population. Yes. That, yes. And let them make that decision. Um, any other comments or questions here? Okay, let's thank, thank Tony. You. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Lauren Podraski. Are you here? All right. Uh, one of, uh, we're, uh, we're heavily weighted with nurse anesthesia students, I see here, yes. So, Lauren, you want to go ahead up there and get your slides up? Um, okay. Can we have some help in accessing the slides? And while you're doing that, I'll go ahead and introduce Lauren. Well, as you figured out, Lauren is a nurse anesthesia student in our nurse anesthesia program here at Drexel. She was born and raised in Yardley, Pennsylvania. Anybody know where that is? No? Up County? Buffs. Buffs County. Buffs County. Buffs County, yeah. Buff County. All right. Okay. Yeah, that's it. She uh, got her BSN at Penn State University, uh, and at graduation she went to work at St. Mary Medical Center on the, on the telemetry and trauma unit. After a year she transferred to the cardiovascular ICU. It looks like perhaps then you were thinking of being a nurse anesthetist? Yes, I was. You had that in the back of your head and that was... Just a little bit. Just a little bit, yeah. okay. <laughs> Uh, she served as a member of the unit-based safety committee providing education to peers regarding um, restraint safety policies and regulations mandated by JCO. So she's going to tell us today, look at the evidence of looking at regional anesthesia in preventing chronic pain syndrome in mastectomy patients. So I thought this was such a, such a great um, look at the evidence and if we could, so first we'll look at the evidence and then talk about how we can get this out into practice more effectively. So let's welcome Lauren. Give her a hand. All right. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, again, today I'll be discussing the effectiveness of regional anesthesia in preventing chronic pain syndrome in mastectomy patients. Um, I took particular interest in this topic after providing anesthesia to multiple mastectomy patients. I noticed throughout the cases and postoperatively that their opioid consumption was higher than other patients. Um, I was curious if there was anything we could do to add to their anesthetic plan to decrease opioid consumption and control their acute and chronic pain postoperatively. So breast cancer is the result of the development of malignant cells that originate in the lining of the milk glands or ducts of the breast. According to National Breast Cancer Foundation, one in eight women will be diagnosed in her lifetime. <clears throat> it is the second leading cause of cancer death in women, and each year it is estimated that over 230,000 women in the United States will be diagnosed with breast cancer, and more than 40,000 will pass away. Variations of the mastectomy procedure have been developed to treat those with breast cancer. 
<clears throat> surgery itself and associated nerve damage induces pain and inflammatory responses, which sensitizes nociceptors, resulting in a bombardment of neural activity. Extensive neural activity can produce chemical, structural, and function changes in the peripheral and central nervous systems, resulting in allodynia, sensory loss, and shooting pains long after surgery or nerve insult have resolved. Some mastectomy patients will develop a complex pain syndrome, referred to as a chronic pain syndrome, other names for the syndrome, pain syndrome, post-mastectomy pain syndrome, or persistent pain after treatment for breast cancer. For the purpose of this presentation, we'll stick with complex pain syndrome, CPS. <clears throat> CPS is a um, neuropathic pain often associated with breast cancer surgery due to the close proximity of multiple nerve tracts, like the brachial plexus and intercostal brachial tract that can be injured during surgery. CPS occurs over a three-month period or longer and is associated with physical disability, emotional distress, or even or even complete incapacitation leading to emotional devastation of a patient. Um, it's estimated that this complex pain syndrome affects 25 to 60% of patients that have gone, undergone mastectomy surgery. Currently, general anesthesia alone does not provide postoperative pain and relief for the syndrome. It is unclear if the occurrence of CPS in mastectomy patient population will decrease with utilization of regional anesthesia as an adjunct to general anesthesia. So the PICO question that I formulated for this research is as follows. Um, do patients having mastectomy surgery who receive thoracic epidurals or thoracic paravertebral blocks compared to similar patients who do not receive any regional anesthesia have a lower incidence of chronic pain syndrome three months or greater after surgery? Four databases were searched throughout this research, Cochrane Library, PubMed, Ovid SP, and Sinal um, and CINAHL. Uh, key words used were mastectomy, thoracic epidurals, paravertebral blocks, and chronic pain syndrome from the previously mentioned PICO question. Um, four research articles were chosen from the above mentioned databases and further scrutinized. The first study, titled Pre-incisional Paravertebral Block Reduces the Prevalence of Chronic Pain After Breast Surgery, is a prospective randomized placebo-controlled and single-blind study of 60 patients who received breast cancer surgery. Before general anesthesia, 30 patients were given a paravertebral block with 0.5% pupivacaine, 1.5 milligrams per kilogram at T3, and 30 other patients were injected with saline subcutaneously. The two groups of patients were followed for 14 days via diary and then telephone interviews at one month, six months, 12 months after surgery. The second study, titled Regional Anesthesia to Prevent Chronic Pain After Surgery, a Cochrane Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis, selected 23 RCTs out of 4,481 references obtained from electronic searches of Medline, Embase, Central, and CINAHL, focusing on the use of regional anesthesia to prevent chronic pain after various surgeries known to contribute to CPS. For purpose of the PICO question, the focus of this analysis was on two RCTs, examining the effects of paravertebral block for breast cancer surgery six months postoperatively. Pooled data from the two RCTs totaled 89 par patients that participated. Can I ask a Surely. In that first study you had up, mm -hmm. um, so 30 patients received this uh, Block, mm -hmm. but 30 did not. Mm -hmm. Did the 30 have anything? No, they just had general anesthesia. Oh, so but you didn't okay. know who was receiving the medication, the bupivacaine. It was either the people that uh, received local anesthetic or patients they thought they were receiving a block. So the block was saving. on top of the general anesthesia. Yeah, so Got it. Purpose, all patients will be under general anesthesia and then also receive this block as an adjunct. Um, the third study titled Thoracic Paravertebral Block and Its Effects on Chronic Pain and Health-Related Quality of Life After Modified Radical Mastectomy was a prospective randomized control trial evaluating 180 women who received a modified radical mastectomy. The 180 women were randomly assigned one of three anesthetic groups. Of these three study groups, group one received only general anesthesia. 
Group two received general anesthesia with a single injection ther thoracic paravertebral block, and group three received general anesthesia with a continuous paravertebral block. The fourth and final study, titled Reducing Persistent Postoperative Pain and Disability One Year After Breast Cancer Surgery, a randomized controlled trial comparing thoracic paravertebral block to local anesthetic infiltration, is a randomized controlled double-blind trial where 145 participants scheduled for elective breast cancer surgery were placed in one of two anesthetic groups. Group one received a thoracic paravertebral block followed by general anesthesia, and group two received a local anesthetic infiltration followed by general anesthesia. So now we will go over the results of each study. In the first study, um, the first 14 days, patients use visual analog scale to record their pain, nausea and vomiting. A group blinded study assistant then completed telephone interviews evaluating the patient's current pain with a numeric rating scale at one month, six months, and 12 months after surgery. The results of the study found at 14 days, the use, of, the use of analgesics was similar in both groups. At one month and six months after surgery, the intensity of pain was statistically significantly lower in the paravertebral block group. At 12 months after surgery, the incidence of pain, motion-related pain, and pain at rest was also statistically significantly lower in the paravertebral block group. In the second study, the focus of this analysis was on the two RCTs examining the effects of paravertebral block for breast cancer surgery six months postoperatively. Pooled data from the two RCTs, totaling 89 participants, suggested that women who received a paravertebral block were less likely to experience symptoms of chronic pain um, after breast cancer surgery than their counterparts who received conventional postoperative pain control. In the third study, outcomes were assessed during the acute postoperative phase and at three and six month intervals focusing on acute pain, chronic pain, and analgesic consumption. The results of this study found no statistically significant differences <coughs> during the acute phase between the three groups. However, both study groups that received paravertebral blocks, the single injection versus the continuous infusion, reported, reported lower chronic pain scores and exhibited fewer chronic pain symptoms during the follow-up period compared to the control group. The final study, all patients were assessed before surgery and one year after surgery. Results showed that nine patients met criteria for CPS one year following surgery. That's nine patients out of 145 participants. Of the nine patients, five patients were in the paravertebral block group and four patients were in the local anesthetic group. So those people just received a local infiltration. Brief pain inventory severity and interfer interference scores were low in both groups and arm morbidity and quality of life were similar in both groups. So I'll go over the clinical implications of these results. Based on the research findings, it is strongly advised that women undergoing breast cancer surgery should receive a form of regional anesthesia as an adjunct to general anesthesia to decrease the occurrence of CPS. Consistently, in all the studies assessed, chronic pain was statistically significantly reduced in, res in women receiving reg regional anesthesia before breast cancer surgery compared to those who do not. Prevention of the development of CPS in these patients is paramount when considering the inconvenient discomforts, complete incapacitation, emotional devastation that can be caused by this complex pain syndrome. Implementation for change in clinical practice for breast cancer surgery requires the education of healthcare providers and patients. Key, sto st key stakeholders impacted by the clinical change include the patients, anesthesia providers, surgeons, and nurses. The advantage of regional anesthesia's impact on the prevention of CB CPS needs to be discussed with patients prior to surgery, the anesthesia personnel performing the block, and with the surgeons performing the surgery. Education of the psychological, emotional, and physical benefits for patients along with positive financial impact of these changes can be addressed through educational sessions. Patients can receive this education throughout their consultations and preoperative visits, where surgeons and other health care providers can be reached through educational sessions. With any type of change, there will be challenges and burdens that need to be overcome. Burdens include the lack of education, changing previously accepted practice by health care providers, 
and the time and training of administering regional anesthesia before surgery, which can cause a possible delay in surgical times. Clinical change is feasible with the burdens presented by adopting a new policy for breast cancer surgery. A new surgical policy for breast cancer surgery will adopt the addition of regional anesthesia, um, regional anesthesia as a new standard of care. Patients undergoing breast cancer surgery should be continuously monitored at follow-up appointments and phone interviews at three-month intervals post-operatively assessing the efficacy of the proposed policy change. The results obtained throughout this time period will be scrutinized and used to determine permanent adaptation of breast cancer surgery policy change. Okay, wow, thank you, Lauren. What strong evidence, huh? That's, that's terrific. I mean, this study shows so much to me anyway. Um, number one, as you're thinking, you've got a question over here. I wanted to just point out, your first study was done in 06. Mm -hmm. That was nine years ago. Number one about that is, that's why I'm hesitant, as different from um, other faculty, on saying only look past, only look at five years ago. Mm -hmm. Because we know from other studies it takes an average of 17 years to get research evidence into practice. And here's a perfect example of that. You have strong evidence there to show that this is effective, and yet it hasn't come into practice yet. Does everybody use regional anesthesia on mastectomy patients? No, you're not seeing it in your practice, right? You're not seeing it. So, um, boy, this, this, there's so much here, but we have a question. I think Dr. McCarthy actually led off a little bit with what my question was, and that was um, for the CRNA students or um, clinicians in the room. I was curious to see in your day-to-day -day experience anecdotally, is this adjunct therapy being proactively offered or sort of more looked at if a patient sort of knows about it or requests it? I know um, a few people who have had obviously separate surgery, but a rotator cuff surgery and the anesthesiologist or CRNA has discussed a block with them and kind of the benefits of that and sort of, you know, lays out the pros and cons of it and usually people end up going with it. So I was just curious if that's sort of happening now or kind of what is the block for it to happen. Right. Honestly, in the What's the barrier? I'm at right now, um, we do not do regional anesthesia for mastectomies. And also speaking to other students, other CRNAs, um, it's really very institutional. It depends on the institution. Um, but primarily, the majority of people I've spoken to um, do not use blocks. Um, this goes for thoracic surgery as well. Um, when I worked in the cardiac ICU, I noticed that a lot of my patients uh, with lung surgery, they would come out with epidurals. So that also led to questions. I mean, we're in the same area. These are high pain procedures. Why are we not doing this for breast cancer? Um, it's already a devastating diagnosis. It can be. It can be psychologically, obviously, our appearance. Um, it's just very stressful on multiple levels. And then to add the pain response that you get after surgery and the potential for a chronic pain syndrome, if we can decrease those chances of that stress alone, that's just one thing less that that woman, that patient has to deal with. So, um, but I think it's just more also, I mean, being proficient at blocks, there needs to be an education. I mean, there's multiple opportunities for um, anesthesia providers to seek out um, regional um, conferences or opportunities to become more proficient because they are time consuming. But with um, ultrasound and practice and doing them more frequently, once you're comfortable with doing them, it's the time consumption shouldn't be there. It shouldn't delay surgical start times. and obviously just decrease a lot of negative outcomes that can come even just by an increased opioid consumption post-operatively. So who would have to order this? Or would there have to be a protocol that some committee in the hospital develops to uh, offer these blocks to breast cancer patients? So or is it up to the surgeon? Um, I mean, obviously, Communication is key anywhere, especially in the OR. So to have a communication between the surgeon and anesthesia and make sure they're okay with the blocks, I mean, there's, there's 
really no negative reasons to these blocks except for time consumption um, beforehand. But it doesn't have to be in order. It's just speaking with the team, the patient, and seeing what the best um, anesthetic plan for that individual is. Um, I know different hospitals do have different protocols for patients, let's say, that are high risk for nausea and vomiting. There's different protocols they will do. So, um, I mean, it would be awesome that there would be a protocol for mastectomy patients like that. So there doesn't have to be an order? No, it's just the anesthetic plan. You kind of communicate with the patient, the surgeon, and the anesthesia providers. Okay. So. We have another answer back here from Tom Kelly, I think, but what was I going to say? Right. What do you think it would help to, in your hospital, you're saying it's not being done there. Mm -mm. How about if, if you do an in-service showing this evidence? Wouldn't that help change practice among anesthesia providers, including it's, nurse anesthetists? It certainly would, yeah. More awareness. Thank you, Dr. McCarthy. Uh, good job, Lauren. Thank you. Uh, just a, a comment. In the 2006 study, uh, I can't, it's a little fuzzy, I can't really read it, but it's interesting that this was a preemptive uh, block. So preemption is, is something else that we know is effective in, in reducing the wind up of painful mediators and the release of, release of bradykinin and substance P, et cetera, et cetera, right? So if you could just touch on that for me. And then finally, in the CHU study, 2000, or 2014, they, they had in their N of 145, 65 individuals received 64 local anesthetics. Can you illuminate what that means when it is injected, what is the agent, are there additives like epinephrine in that? Can you explain that a little bit for me? Um, for, so for the local, I would have to refer back to the article. I can't remember offhand what exactly, if it had epi in it or not. Um, but that's local infiltration to sub-Q tissue. Um, like he was saying, addressing preemptively these blocks. Um, by doing a block, you're preventing um, trying to, you're preventing the stress response, pain factors from even, I mean, being released into your system, kind of keeping that at bay. Um, Dr. Kelly, I, Professor Kelly, am I answering your question correctly? I don't know. Uh... I, I don't think um, people who aren't in the operating room understand how that is utilized. Uh huh. So, so it's, it's the. I mean, the block, is, it's before surgery. So before you're even put to sleep, they would do this block, which prevents, like Dr. Kelly, Professor Kelly was saying, uh, the release of substance P, bradykinin, they're all different substances that are released when there's a pain response in the body. Um, so it's not just, I'm having pain, I'm gonna receive this block. It's to prevent that from occurring. I think the shock here, at but, least, perhaps I'm speaking for some, is that we have the evidence and the practice isn't being done. Yeah. Question? Oh, yes. uh, thank you, Lauren. I really enjoy listening to your presentation. Very informative. Um, I sort of had a similar question um, to the gentleman there. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to know how long the, medic the block lasts. Um, it depends on the type of local that they use in concentrations. So um, there's different, you can use pivocaine, lidocaine, they all have different durations. It's a couple hours, um, more than a couple hours the block can last, but it just depends on the agent and the concentration of local that you would use. As an LND nurse, I work very closely with anesthesiologists and uh, nurse anesthetists. And of course, you know, for a C-section, use a spinal. And um, they also inject uh, Dormorph. Yep. So similar actions there. Like Dormorph usually lasts about 24 hours. Um, well, with these blocks, there I there's potential of mixing. Um, like Professor Op, uh, Kelly was saying, epinephrine, which makes blocks last longer due to a vasoconstriction of the vessels around the area. Um, different blocks can be mixed with a narcotic, but for these studies, narcotic, which Dormorph is. Um, for these studies, they were just ass uh, assessing the administration of a local anesthetic. So um, the way a local works as opposed to uh, an opioid uh, are different mechanisms of action. So you're, they're just different. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Didn't they use a continuous block on some? 
Yeah, the one study, um, it was variable. Majority of the studies that I used in this research were single injections, and then um, for one of the studies, there was a group that had a continuous infusion. Um, I just wanted to add, you know, just to defend the practice of anesthesia just a little bit. It, a lot of it, um, you know, we offer it to patients, but a lot of it's surgically driven. Um, these blocks take time, especially in obese patients. They can, you know, we do, for one surgeon, we do um, single shots and we put paravertebral catheters in it every single mastectomy patient they do. Another surgeon doesn't want that because they say we take too long. So it's not that we're not going to offer the service, it's just ultimately it's up to the surgeon if they want it or not. So. Thanks, Adam. That's a good point. I mean, thank you for enlightening us about that. So what he's saying is that the anesthesia providers are, in your institution, offering the block, but it's the surgeon. Well, maybe someone needs to do an in-service of the surgeons and show them this evidence, like a woman's group. <laughs> Um, great presentation, Lauren. Just again to add, I'm at a site that is very regional um, driven and regional friendly, which I think is great because numerous studies show over and over again that regional anesthesia is a much safer method, I feel like, for future procedures as well as helps benefit patients in the long run from developing these chronic pain syndromes. Um, but it is a lot of culture and how your facility is run. It's definitely individualized to not only surgeons but also that anesthesia provider. Sometimes they're not the most comfortable with blocks or not the most familiar with it, and these do take a lot of practice to become um, really comfortable and be able to do them quickly and efficiently. So it's a little bit of a learning curve, but I think depending on your facility, we're moving more and more that way in the future. Um, just takes time. Like we said, there's the evidence here to show how great it is, but I mean, there's also been evidence saying how spinals and epidurals are the way to go for phantom limb pain, and we're still not seeing all of our amputations being done that way either. So sometimes it's just a change in culture and mentality for the benefit of the patient. Thank you, Sarah. Yes, Sarah, you bring up a very good point. And, and maybe I'll go back to you, Lauren. Unless, any other questions, comments? Yes. Um, but let me take this question, and then we're going to go back to you. OK. Oh, sounds good. Here you go. <laughs> I work as a staff nurse in the perisurgical area, and one of the things that we have to address on a regular basis when we're doing the, the local blocks, and we do it for most of our shoulders, and sometimes knees too, but usually the shoulders, um, is that it takes specialized bedside nursing in the pre-op setting. And so those there has to be a group of nurses trained and ready to assist the anesthesiologist who's doing the block. So that part of the culture change is to address the bedside nursing as well. Mm -hmm. they, need to be, they need to be educated also. Um, anybody else? Lauren, so now you've heard all these comments <laughs> and suggestions. Thank you, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I know. We want to ask her one last question. So back to your institution okay. that you're saying is not routinely doing this. Have you gotten any ideas here on how you could um, begin to, to make this happen. Well, actually, after speaking to a couple of my friends, just, you know, updating them on life in anesthesia school, and I told them about this research, the evidence-based colloquium uh, this week, and I said I was presenting, um, and multiple people asked what I was presenting about, and they even suggested that I possibly present to um, the department. It would be a good thing to do. I mean, uh, awareness mm -hmm. is key, and you have to start yes. somewhere with education. Mm -hmm. um, so... Before I leave there, hopefully I could get something Good. set up. We have educational education meetings every month, so great. That great. would be a prime time to just yep. you know expose this and see just the evidence. Mm -hmm. Focus on the evidence and maybe invite the surgeons mm -hmm. and the peri uh, perioperative nurses to the in service to just share this evidence with them. And I believe that once a person is aware of the evidence. I think that is what will change practice. So that's all up to you right now. I will take that challenge. Okay, Lauren. <laughs> all right. All right. Thank you. Okay, let's let's break for lunch. Our lunch is ready. It looks like, and we'll see you back at about one. Good.
good lunch, everyone. Now, if Carly can keep us awake, right? <laughs> so, <clears throat> we're going to get out of here. The good news here, well, I don't know. I suppose the good news is we're going to get out a little <clears throat> earlier than expected because our last speaker, is it Karen Jones, was unable to make it today. So to get us started this afternoon is Carly Sokoff. Carly is also a nurse anesthesia student. She graduated from the Drexel um, nursing program in 2008. And she was an AJ Drexel scholar, summa cum laude, sigma theta tau. She's worked in uh, the pediatric intensive care unit at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore for five years. And she served in new technology and equipment, evidence-based practice, staff development committees there. She'll graduate in May in the nurse anesthesia program here at Drexel. And she's going to talk to us with her interest in pediatrics. She's going to show us the evidence on the effectiveness of propofol in reducing the incidence of pediatric emergence delirium. So let's welcome Carly Sokoff. <laughs> All righty. So emergent delirium is a phenomenon characterized by uncontrolled aberrant cognitive and psychomotor activity that occurs upon emergence from anesthesia. Um, it's a dissociative state of consciousness characterized by restlessness, irritability, confusion, inconsolability, involuntary movements, avoidance of eye contact, and crying. You can see it in patients of any age, race, gender, or health status. But it occurs most frequently in the pediatric population <clears throat> with reported incidences 15 to 80% in some cases. <clears throat> the exact cause of emergence delirium remains unclear. Um, current hypotheses center around the difference in clearance of fast-acting anesthetic agents from specific areas of the central nervous system during emergence, resulting in an unequal recovery rate of various brain functions. It is theorized that a difference in the clearance of anesthetic agents um, affects psychomotor and auditory functions. They're believed to return more quickly than higher level cognitive functions, such as conscious awareness. They believe that this unbalanced cerebral recovery during rapid emergence results in sensory stimulation during a dissociative state, explaining the uncontrollable and irrational behaviors characteristic of emergence delirium. Um, Sevoflurane, a fast-acting anesthetic agent, has also been associated with a higher incidence of pediatric emergence delirium. Um, other theories are a child's psychological immaturity and inability to cope with anxiety. Um, and certain surgeries like ENT, ophthalmological, and abdominal surgeries have been correlated with increased rates of post-operative emergence delirium. So, I guess one of my slides got, here we go. So there's a bunch of problems with emergence delirium. Obviously, um, it can cause patient self-injury by intense agitation and thrashing, surgical site damage, wound dehiscence, accidental extubation, or removal of IVs. Um, and a study in 2004 found that approximately 50% of children who experience emergence delirium after anesthesia develop new maladaptive behaviors post-operatively, such as separation anxiety, sleep disturbances, bedwetting, and temper tantrums. Um, it can make the parents upset and dissatisfied with their entire perioperative experience and the financial implications of a prolonged PACU stay, additional nursing staff, and sedative drugs to care for the patient. So the PICO statement I used um, was, do pediatric patients undergoing general inhalational anesthesia with sevoflurane who receive propofol before emergence from anesthesia compared to similar patients who do not receive propofol before emergence have a lower incidence of emergence delirium in the post-operative period? So I searched. Um, Use some synonyms here, emergence delirium or emergence agitation, pediatric and children, propofol or diprovan, which is the most common brand name, and sevoflurane. In the Cochrane Library, I found one article. The PubMed database revealed 34, and Sinol, 
um, was six, and the ProQuest also revealed 34. So the first um, study, Lee et al., was done in 2010. It's a randomized controlled trial, prospective double-blinded, conducted in Korea. They looked at 90 children aged three to eight years old, ASA1s, um, having a TNA. They found that, um, I'm sorry, they measured four different scales of pediatric emergence delirium at five, 15, and 30 minutes after emergence, and they found that propofol, one milligram per kilo, did not produce any statistically significant reductions at any time interval on any of the four scales that were used. Um, but in this population, anesthesia was induced with five milligrams per kilo of thiopental and maintained with 2.5% sevoflurane and 50% nitrous. All the patients were intubated and um, one parent was allowed to stay with the child in the PACU. Abu Shawan in 2008 did another randomized controlled prospective double blinded study in Egypt. They looked at 85 children aged two to seven years old, ASAs one to three. They were having general anesthesia for um, an MRI. They evaluated the pediatric anesthesia emergency delirium scores um, upon awakening and every five minutes during the first 30 minutes after admission to the PACU. They found that administration of one milligram per kilo, they gave up to um, 30 milligrams maximum. After the discontinuation of a sevoflurane general anesthetic significantly reduced the incidence and the severity on the scale of emergency delirium compared to the saline group. Um, these patients received um, an inhalational induction with 60% nitrous and SIVO. They were maintained on SIVO and nitrous, and they put LMAs in all these patients. Um, this study was important because it shows that emergency delirium um, occurs in even pain-free procedures. The parents were allowed to be present for induction, and they were able to rejoin the child in the PACU at the discretion of the charge nurse. They found that the highest, highest incidence of agitation occurred within the first 15 minutes of PACU arrival, and they found that no significant difference um, was found in recovery time or PACU discharge time. So at two in 2007, they also did a randomized double-blinded prospective study in Lebanon. They looked at 80 children aged two to six years old, ASA 1 and 2, having general anesthesia for strabismus surgery. Um, they also administered propofol, 1 milligram per kilo, and they found that this reduced the PAED scores and the incidence of emergency delirium significantly. They also found that parental satisfaction was significantly improved in the propofol group, and the time to the removal of the LMA in the emergency time were significantly longer in the propofol group, but the overall PACU discharge times were comparable. These patients received inhalational inductions um, with nitrous and LMA, or nitrous and SIVO. They all had LMAs. They were given um, 15 milligrams per kilo of IV Tylenol and Decadron for post-op pain control. One child was allowed to stay, or one parent was allowed to stay with the child in the PACU and significantly more parents in the propofol group rated the quality of their child's PACU stay as excellent. Van Hoff, O'Neill, Cohen, and Collins in 2015 did a systematic review and meta-analysis of nine randomized placebo-controlled trials evaluating the efficacy of a prophylactic dose of propofol given at the end of a sevoflurane anesthetic to reduce emergency delirium. All of these um, trials were completed in hospitals. Uh, they included the countries of Canada, Egypt, Lebanon, Saudi Arabia, Korea, and China. And all of the trials were judged to be low risk of bias. Overall, they looked at 997 children aged 0 to 13 years old receiving general anesthesia with sevoflurane. And the inclusion criteria for this meta-analysis was that the study had to give one milligram per kilo of propofol at the end of anesthesia, and agitation must have been assessed using the PAD scale within 60 minutes of emergence. 
So overall, they found that a dose of prophylactic propofol was associated with a reduction in the severity of emergency delirium and significantly decreased the incidence of emergency delirium compared to the placebo group, 33% um, in the propofol group versus 59. Um, although propofol was associated with significantly lengthened time to awakening, it did not significantly increase recovery time in total. Um, uh, in all, it was less than 10 minutes. Hmm. The overall rates of reported adverse events were low, and no st t statistically significant differences were found between the groups. Um, most commonly reported was nausea and vomiting, laryngospasm, desaturation, apnea, and hypotension. So synthesizing the evidence, two studies showed statistically significant reductions in both the incidence and the severity of emergence delirium with the administration of propofol before emergence from a sevoflurane general anesthetic. The meta-analysis results found that the administration of propofol was associated with a statistically significant reduction in the mean PAED score in four studies, and data from eight trials demonstrated a statistically significant lower incidence of emergence delirium. The mean time to awakening was found to be significantly longer in the propofol groups in six of the studies. However, no significant difference in the length of the total PACU stay existed. Um, the only study that didn't find statistically significant results was Lee, which may be explained by differences in research methods, such as the administration of thiopental, which is a powerful hypnotic on induction and the assessment of emergency delirium only at specific time intervals and not continuously throughout the emergence process. So consistent results across multiple studies conducted in several countries examining large age spans and various surgical procedures suggest broad generalizability of these findings and the large effect size is suggestive of a clinically relevant change in practice. Based on this evidence, it is recommended that anesthesia providers consider giving propofol at the end of sevoflurane general anesthetics to decrease the incidence of emergency delirium and create a better perioperative experience for their patients and families. Okay, thank you, Carly. <clears throat> thank you. Questions, comments? Anybody using propofol out there on your kids? Yeah? Yes, question? <laughs> Thank you. Um, I was wondering, did you come across any studies, um, or, or uh, is it common to use like benzos instead of propofol, or um, is it generally just propofol because of short acting that's utilized to to reduce delirium? So originally, benzos were investigated as you know to prevent emergence delirium. As you know, they're commonly used as an oral premed for these kiddos. Um, but the results show that it's not statistically significant. But we, it's still used as a pre-med to help with separation from parents and stuff like that. It wasn't. It wasn't effective. Yeah. I was. I was looking too at your looking at your first study that showed no significant difference compared to the other three. Mm -hmm. And I hear what you're saying. It was the methodology and how they when and how they measured their emergence delirium. Mm -hmm. But I wondered another one a factor in it is that first study was pa all the patients had uh, TNAs. Yep. And the second was an MRI, which isn't painful. And the third was strabismus, which is pretty minimally compared to a uh, TNA, tonsillectomy, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you think that might have been a factor? In your fourth study, you didn't say what kind of surgeries they were having. Yeah, the fourth study was just the meta-analysis of all the, of, of, of nine different studies, or was it eight? Right. And so, they all had different, different, and it was zero to 13 years, I think. Yeah. So could have been, they were could all different anything. surgeries. Huh? Yeah, the first, the Lee study that didn't find any statistically significant results, um, all those patients were intubated. That was a difference. Mm. They received thiopental and induction. The rest of them were inhalation inductions with no uh. other sort of sedative other than a Versed pre-med. Uh -huh. um, and... The well, can you stop for there just a second? So with the thiopenthal, 
um, pentaoral induction, do you think they were they had less SIVO? I mean, that's a difference. I don't know difference. that they had less SIVO, but I mean, thiopental has a long half life and it's a yeah. sedative, so it could affect. Oh, okay. So maybe like that sedative may be seen at the end still yeah. that allowed a smoother emergence mm -hmm. in in because that's why they think the propofol. Um, works is that it actually after you turn off the SIVO, you kind of resubmerge, re, resubmerge and the let patient them so that they come up a come little up slower. A, maybe a little bit slower yeah. with the propofol, maybe, and maybe that's what thiopental provided Correct. in both of those groups yes. in that first study. Yes, question. Oh, did we not give Carly a hand? Did we not give her? Did we? <laughs> yeah, come Let's on, give her a hand for her great work. Sorry, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Carly. <laughs> Carly, thank you so much for uh, the research on this. I work in a pediatric perisurgical setting. Um, one thing with the tonsils, the one thing you didn't mention I was kind of waiting for was IV Tylenol, which I heard I think in the third study that they were talking about. Um, one of our anesthesiologists, Dr. Britton, who unfortunately no longer is working with us due to illness, um, developed a cocktail that we started using amongst our pediatric tonsillectomy patients and that always included IV Tylenol. And the kids came out so much better. As a PACU nurse, <laughs> much, please give all your patients IV Tylenol in the back. Yeah. They all do better. <laughs> um, the other thing is that in our facility, we do not generally give PO verse said on a regular basis preoperatively because it's researched, and I don't have anything in front of me to tell you who's done the research, but it's researched to prolong the pack you stay um, when you when you give PO verse said. Um, so we typically don't use it, and we do we do a lot of non non pharmacological anxiolytics, which is what my study was on, <laughs> and. Um, it had, those tools work beautifully, mm -hmm. preoperatively. Parental presence during the induction of anesthesia and having the parents in the recovery room as well. Um, parents have to be instructed, however, that the, um, they cannot chill a child out from emergence. They, if the parents know that ahead of time, they are armed with the tools. Again, back to communication. If parents come in and they see their child freaked out and the parent freaks out, it makes the kid even freaked out more. Mm -hmm. So it, the parents have to be educated up front and told that, and that's part of our preoperative process. Um, so kudos for this. This is awesome. Anything that helps our kids wake up better, I'm all for it. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. <clears throat> Any other questions or comments? on this presentation from Carly. All right, let's give her a hand. Come on. Thank you. Thank you. Such, such great. And let me, let me, can I ask you one question before you go? So at your hospital, are you using this? Um, so at, at AI DuPont, where I did my pediatric rotation, it was, um, I think most providers gave a small bowl of propofol as we were heading to the PACU. Um, another drug, dexmedetomidine, is coming off a of patent, and I'm at CHOP now doing cardiac, and every single patient gets dex like it's water. If they so get placebo or just, just in general, everybody gets it. Okay. So I think there's... To prevent this yeah. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, I don't know because I don't stay in the PACU and watch them, but... I originally wanted to compare propofol versus dexmedetomidine, but there aren't enough studies on it. This is, yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. We simplified it to just propofol versus no propofol. Right, right, right. Well, I hope if you're thinking of your doctorate, you know, your DMP, this is the beginning. This is the beginning of that work. So, all right. Emily. Oh, no. Emily. Emily Miller. Are you here? All right, come on up, Emily. Okay, can someone help Emily get her slides up? Thank you. Um, as we begin, so Emily is also in the nurse anesthesia program, and she's planning, not hoping, planning on, to, on graduating in May. Right, Emily? 
She's uh, originally from Overland Park, Kansas. I think I've been there. I think yeah. I've been there. Overland Park, right. Have you ever heard of Unity Village? How did no Overland Park? You were there a while ago, I guess. But you graduated from Kansas State University with actually a BS in chemistry and a second major in gerontology. She pursued her BSN at the University of Pennsylvania and graduated in 2010. She has worked in the neurointensive care unit at the University of Pennsylvania. And now, as you heard in the anesthesia program, and she's going to tell us about the efficacy, look at the studies of Sugamadex, which has been FDA approved now. Yes. I think it was December 15th or 16th. December. Of 2015. Of 14, no, 15, just like 15. Two, two just, months ago. Yeah, we've been waiting around for this approval, haven't we, for a long time. Um, so it, it finally got through FDA and preventing the postoperative residual neuromuscular blockade. So let's welcome Emily Miller's presentation. Thank you, Dr. McCarthy. I'll be talking today about the efficacy of Sugomidex in preventing postoperative residual neuromuscular blockade. So for a background, as all you anesthesia folk know, neuromuscular blocking agents are used every day in our daily practice. Uh, they're used to facilitate tracheal intubation and provide optimal surgical conditions. Complete reversal of neuromuscular blocking agents after surgery is essential in preventing residual muscle relaxation. So the current reversal agent used uh, today is an anticholinesterase agent such as neostigmine along with an anticholinergic. I'm not sure why you can't see the top of that. but. Um, the problem is residual neuromuscular blockade. The definition of this is the occurrence of muscle weakness during the postoperative period after the intraoperative administration of a neuromuscular blocking agent. And this is determined by a train of four ratio. If the train of four ratio is less than 0.9, residual neuromuscular blockade is present. And to measure this, we use acceleromyography, which is a quantitative measurement of peripheral nerve stimulation. It is the ratio of the fourth twitch to the first twitch. The incidence of residual neuromuscular blockade when a short or any intermediate neuromuscular blocking agent is administered ranges anywhere from 16 to 60 percent. The complications of residual neuromuscular blockade is unfortunately a pretty long list. Um, some of them include increased morbidity and mortality and respiratory complications. These are really important because respiratory complications are the second most common post-op complication after wound infection. Some of those complications include hypoxemia, airway obstruction, pneumonia, and atelectasis. Other complications may include longer PACU stay, swallowing dysfunction, impaired hypoxic ventilatory drive, delays in tracheal extubation, and difficulty speaking and drinking. So that's when we come to Sugamidex. So what is Sugamidex? It's a new alternative to our current reversal agents. It was actually developed back in the 1990s, and it is the first selective relaxant binding agent that's used to reverse neuromuscular blockade. The way it works is it is a synthetically modified gamma cyclodextrin that rapidly encapsulates steroidal neuromuscular blocking agents. It does this with electrostatic and van der Waals forces that form a tight complex and then uh, that renders them unable to bind to acetylcholine receptors. So Sugamidex has actually been used in Europe since 2008. I just read something the other day that in Germany it's used like 95% of the time. And it's also used in other 70 other countries worldwide. And when I wrote this paper last summer, it hadn't been approved yet, but luckily, before I did this presentation, it was approved in December 2015. So the purpose of this presentation is to describe the evidence on the efficacy of Sugamidex in preventing postoperative residual neuromuscular blockade compared to neostigmine with an anticholinergic. My PICO question was, do adult patients receiving intraoperative neuromuscular blockade with rocuronium 
when reversed with Sugamidex compared to similar patients reversed with neostigmine have less residual neuromuscular blockade postoperatively. For my search methods, the keywords and synonyms I used were Sugamidex, cyclodextrin, residual neuromuscular block, curarization, postoperative, neostigmine, anticholinesterase, and the databases I used were the Cochrane Library, um, CINAHL, PubMed, and OVID. So now I'm going to go through my four studies that were included on my evidence table. Overall, I had one systematic review and three randomized controlled trials. First, I'm going to talk about Abrashami et al.'s systematic review that was published in 2009. This was actually the first systematic review on Sugamidex. It's a systematic review of 18 RCTs with a total of 1,321 patients that compared the effectiveness of Sugamidex to neostigmine at preventing residual neuromuscular blockade. Compared with placebo, or this is, these are the results from the study, compared with placebo or neostigmine, Sugamidex more rapidly reversed rocuronium-induced neuromuscular blockade, and the important thing is regardless of the depth of the block. So any block, how, however deep the patient, or however blocked the patient is, um, reversal was able to happen with Sugamidex. Um, another result was Sugamidex reversed profound neuromuscular blockade in less than three minutes compared to neostigmine, which took over 50 minutes. Um, they, they also um, included some studies on vacuronium and pancuronium but they were very limited amount of studies, so they didn't provide any conclusions on those drugs. All right, so the next study was by Bruickman et al. in 2015, last year. This was a randomized controlled trial conducted in subjects undergoing elective laparoscopic or open abdominal surgery with rocuronium-induced neuromuscular blockade. Um, 74 patients received Sugamidex, and 77 received usual care, which is the combination of neostigmine and glycopyrrolate. The results showed that 0 out of 74, or 0%, Sugamidex patients, and 33 out of 76, or 43.4%, usual care patients, had a TOFWATCH assessed residual neuromuscular blockade at PACU admission. And the TOFWATCH is the acceleromyography that gives you that uh, train of four ratio number. Um, in addition, the neostigmine glyco group, 11% of them actually had a train of four even less than 0.7 at PACU admission. And they also found that there was decreased time from drug administration to OR discharge readiness for Sugamidex compared to neostigmine. My next study was by Gazinski et al. in 2012. This was an RCT that compared Sugamidex with neostigmine for reversal of rocuronium-induced muscle relaxation in morbidly obese patients undergoing general anesthesia for elective bariatric surgery. 35 patients were assigned to the Sugamidex group, and 35 patients were assigned to the neostigmine and atropine group. Results showed that the mean time to achieve a train of four ratio of 0.9 was 3.5 times shorter in the Sugamidex group compared to the neostigmine group. To be more specific, the Sugamidex group, it took 1.9 to 2.5 minutes, and the neostigmine group, it took 9.5 minutes. Uh, the study also showed that the train of four ratio at PACU arrival was higher in the Sugamidex group and reached over 90% or 0.9 in every case. Um, the last conclusion they had was that administration of Sugamidex prevents residual neuromuscular blockade in the morbidly obese, however, neostigmine does not. And the last study I chose was by Sabo et al. in 2011. This was an RCT that compared Sugamidex with neostigmine and the reversal of rocuronium-induced blockade in patients undergoing abdominal surgery. Residual neuromuscular blockade was measured at extubation. And this is different than the previous two RCTs in that the train of four ratio was measured 
right at extubation instead of at PACU admission. A total of 106 patients were randomized to receive either Sugomidex or Neostigmine and glycopyrrolate. Of these, 100 actually ended up receiving treatment. Uh, results showed that a train of four ratio greater than or equal to 0.9 was reached at or before extubation in 48 out of 50, or 96% of Sugomidex patients, and 17 of 43, or 39.5% of Neostigmine patients. And you may be asking, what about the two patient, Sugomidex patients that didn't reach 0.9? Well, one of them, their train of four ratio was 0 0.89, which to me that rounds up to 0 0.9. And one of them actually had artifact and technical issues in their measurement. And that one only reached 0 0.38. The authors of this article believe that to be inaccurate. Another result was that the median time from study drug administration to train of four ratio greater than or equal to 0 0.9 was two minutes for Sugomidex versus eight minutes for Neostigmine. And finally, they concluded that without the use of quantitative neuromuscular monitoring, patients treated with Neostigmine and Glyco are more likely to experience residual neuromuscular blockade. And for people who don't do anesthesia, um, at least in my clinical practice, we rarely use quantitative monitoring. It's mostly qualitative monitoring. So here's a quick summary of the results of these studies. Um, all three out of the three RCTs, um, they showed decreased incidence of neuromuscular blockade with Sugomidex compared to Neostigmine. And with the exception of the two patients in Sabo's study, um, all Sugomidex subjects in the three RCTs showed no residual neuromuscular blockade. Um, they also showed a decreased time to achieve a train of four ratio greater than, greater than or equal to 0 0.9 in the Sugomidex group compared to the Neostigmine group. And then back to the systematic review, Sugomidex reversed any depth of rocuronium-induced neuromuscular blockade within three minutes, and neuromuscular blockade reversal was more rapid with Sugomidex than with Neostigmine. And for my clinical implications, it is recommended from this evidence that Sugomidex be used to reverse neuromuscular blockade instead of neostigmine to decrease patients' risk of postoperative residual neuromuscular blockade. And currently, this drug is it's finally starting to reach hospitals. It hasn't reached my clinical site yet, um, but hopefully it will shortly. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, Emily. All right, terrific. The timing is great, right? We've just had it FDA approve this drug, Sugamidex, that we've been waiting, what, at least five years or so, would you say? You don't um, know. You've only, what would, what well, would you providers out there say? Oh, over five years. Over probably. five I years? Because it's been it's used been in, in Europe, Europe. for eight years. For eight years, right. So we've heard about it, but we've been unable to use it. Um, how about the cost of this versus neostigmine? Um, I think it's a little bit more expensive. I don't. I don't have an actual number. I My guess I, I would be. I want to say like in the two hundreds. Two hundred, a dose per vial. Per vial. Um, but uh, the the neostigmine or the the new bloxivers. That's that's the new name. For the new name. The that, new that is coming. It's actually increased. It, it's no longer generic. So now it's ninety-seven dollars oh. a vial. So How much? Ninety-seven. Oh, and wow! And it used to be, I think, just it's no a few longer dollars. generic. We just took a generic drug and made it ungeneric. How did we do that? Um, but okay, so you're saying that the cost might not be prohibitive. With has anybody used this drug out there yet? Anybody seen it? Anybody? Nobody's heard that their pharmacy is ordering it. Yes. Wait a minute. <laughs> Thanks, Emily. Nice presentation. So, um, we were just talking about this before she went up. My clinical site has it in the hospital. It's on formulary. They're just working out some kinks. I guess apparently there's 
Um, I just heard this, I didn't read it myself, but I might inactivate birth control for a week, so I'm trying to figure out how the logistics of administering that to women that are of childbearing age and you know, what kind of discussion you're gonna have or what the liability would be if they got pregnant, so. Mm. Mm. <laughs> um, well, the timing might be good for you to present it, to do this as an educational presentation to your folks in your OR. Um, I hope you're considering that. Um, do you think for you wise providers, old wise providers over here, do you think it's worth it? Yeah, that's not you. Uh, yes, you, including you, Lou. Um, do you think you're going to see a change with this? Or do you think it's worth the change? Do you think there's a big problem with patient safety with uh, neuromuscular blockade and neostigmine? Is there a big enough, you know what I mean, risk-benefit ratio here? Well, the, um, what happened with neostigmine is, oh, th thank you very much. <laughs> the, um, they found a glitch in the paperwork and a uh, very clever uh, European anesthetic uh, drug provider um, petitioned the FDA and they, of course, approved them for reversal of neuromuscular blockade while the other generic versions weren't specifically approved, although they were used for that. They weren't specifically approved. And then the, the cost skyrocketed hundreds of percent. So, so correct. So Sugamidex is happening at a good time. But what we're finding is we're using less and less neuromuscular blockers particularly in, in children, if, if they don't need, if we don't have a chest or abdominal case or some, an eye case or something where we don't want them to move, we're, we're not using, we're not blocking patients. So um, th there's a safety factor there and I can attest that I woke up after my back surgery, I recurized in the PACU, of course it's gonna happen to me because I'm an anesthesia provider. So there I was for 45 minutes looking at the clock, listening to my pulse ox and I, I couldn't move a, a finger. So it was uh, a scary thing. So I'm particularly sensitive to that. And um, I can't, I was, I was. And I had, I had 100 of rocuronium and I had the appropriate reversal dose and what have you. But yet I woke up, you know, paralyzed or relaxed as we like to say. <laughs> so you don't want to tell a patient you're gonna paralyze them. So we just say they're relaxed. Oh, I didn't give that? I thought I gave that. No. Will it be worth, will it be worth making this change to Sagamidex? Well, yes, because it's, it's specifically formulated for rocuronium, but however, it does work with vecuronium as well. Um, but I think we're going to see a shift to it from a safety standpoint because it's a very specific um, uh, pharmacologic action because it's an encapsulating technology. The, the, um, Administration of neostigmine and, and glycopyrrolate is a complex pharmacologic phenomenon which causes a blocking of enzymes, blah, blah, what have you, and the accumulation of acetylcholine. So it's, it's a very complex thing we do to reverse neuromuscular blockade, right? So this is just a one very simple mechanism. And, and, and it's, I think it's being held off the marketplace because of, of um, originally they said it was allergic reactions and then it was cost and now there's, the politics are involved now too. So why do you think the real reason was that it was held off the market? Does, do we dare to say in public? Anybody have an opinion about that? Well, what do you mean politics? What does that mean? <laughs> Jane. What? Uh, we have a comment over here. Oh, yes, go ahead. Hello, that was a great presentation, thank you. I'm wondering if um, you came across the use of uh, Sugamidex at all for myasthenia gravis, knowing that neostigmine's used for that at all? Excuse me if I missed something in the pharmacology of it that would prohibit that. I Did everyone hear the question? Myasthenia gravis, have you seen it used with that patient population? I have not. I, has anyone? heard or read or seen? No. It, it works completely different. Oh, to treat. You're talking about treating. Right. My, oh. That's an alternative. I was thinking about using it on a patient that had myasthenia, but right. you're talking treat. about actually treating it. Oh, no, I'm, t I'm oh, right. talking Not about a, a patient that comes of. to the OR. Right. That, yeah. Exactly. Treating it. I right. No, I haven't heard of that. Does it have a, a longer or a shorter 
half-life than neostigmine? Much you know? shorter. Okay, sorry. Much sorry to ask you yeah. things that no, that's make okay. you say you're not sure. But it works completely different. Like so, it, right. It's very specific to uh, steroidal neuromuscular blockades like rocuronium. Right. And the, the whole point of it is to bind to rocuronium. To that and, specifically. And basically get out of the system. Right. Thank you. It binds up the, the drug, the rock. Any other comments? Yes. Just a question. You had said that the half-life is very short. Is it, did I hear you say that? My concern is when you give reversal agents, do you have to watch the patient in the PACU for the medication to come back around again and re-paralyze? Or is this a one and done, you're finished, it binds, and it's not gonna come back? So I did read a little bit about, they call that re and I don't think it's very common, but they actually, so they, it's kind of like neostigmine, but there's more specific doses for reversal. And they actually have a dose that you can give and pack you for that specific reason, recurrization. But I don't think it's, it, w it wasn't one of the big complications or side effects that I read. Any other questions? Yes, over here. Hi, Emily, nice presentation. Um, I just had a couple of questions. One, do you know anything about uh, if you had to take that patient back to the OR, you're not gonna be able to use rocuronium again because if you gave it, the Sugamidex would just bind to it. Do you know how long the time period is if you, wanted, if you had to go back to the OR and if you wanted to reuse rocuronium? I didn't read anything about that. But I, I would agree with you that you cannot use rock urinium. I mean, I guess you just you know you pick something else. Uh, the Bruckerman study from last year, you mentioned that I think 11 patients had a uh, train of four ratio less than 0.7. Did they talk about that at all as to why they thought it was it? Did they look at the dose or the timing or anything? I was just curious. Um, I can get back to you on that one. <laughs> I don't remember specifically. I know where you live. <laughs> <laughs> I have the article right here. Um, and <laughs> then just to add, and that's fine, um, just to add to um, your question, Jane, about its use, I think because of the cost, it, yes, there's definitely a need. Yes, there's a safety concern with using neostigmine and um, um, Rubinol for reversal, and then, you know, recurarization potential in, in the PACU, but I think also, the cost of $200 per vial may also limit its use in certain situations or certain patient populations. But who knows? Yes. Yes. Yeah, nice job, Ms. Miller. Uh, and I understand a recent British Journal of Anesthesia study uh, reported that the cost for a 75 kilogram patient is between 60 and 120 pounds. How much is that? Can you convert that for me? <laughs> That's 200. Or so. And just to go back to Jane, your other question about its approval in the United States, kind of what someone here in the audience mentioned, um, it, it, there were some politics related to, at least that's, that's the rumor that's out there. Related to the drug company. Yeah, the drug, the, the, the drug company, the neostigmine drug company didn't want to see this on the market. That's basically the politics. Is that, that's not the politics? The story. The story is. The, the story. I don't know the whole background, but the company that is making and producing Sugamidex has a history of making the FDA not happy or making the FDA look bad in the, in the past. So I think there was some politics about the FDA specifically targeting the company that was pushing to get Sugamidex passed. Um, well, it, but it's not an, is it an American company? Isn't it a European? It's Merck. Who's got it, Merck? It's Merck. Okay, Merck. Okay, uh, okay, Merck feels like FDA doesn't like them. Is, oh, I mean, no, that's kind of what, yeah. I, 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 you know, I used to work at FDA, right? 
Yeah, right. So, um, <laughs> I used to. <laughs> I used to work at FDA, but I, I guess that's why I'm sort of curious. I just haven't been able to figure out why it's taken so long for this drug to get approved. But I'm not surprised that there's some kind of politics. Um, the fact that it was that personal, I don't know. Okay, um, excellent job. Thank you so much. All right. <laughs> you know, we have two more presenters. Anybody who wants to keep going, who wants to take a break? Keep going? Keep going. Okay, shall we keep going? Uh, okay. Who have we got here? Emily just finished. Now we've got Anna Spence. Anna, are you here? Here she comes. Anna. All right. So Anna is, um, let's see, the safety of the LMA. She's also in the nurse anesthesia program. Do you need help? No, we, we should, someone will help you, I hope. We've got the slides on the computer there for you. Uh huh. So Anna is also in the anesthesia program and she graduated from Bloomsburg University. Where is Bloomsburg University? Up the Northeast Extension in mm -hmm. Pennsylvania. Up the Northeast Extension in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. okay. The northern part of Pennsylvania? Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. So, and that's where she got her BSN and she spent two years working on a telemetry floor at the um, University of Pennsylvania Hospital and worked in the cardiothoracic ICU for four years where she was anticipating being admitted into the Drexel anesthesia program. Okay, you were close by, so just waiting for that to happen. And now she's in the program and will graduate in May. She recently married and lives in New Jersey. So she's gonna talk to us about the safety of the laryngeal mask airway in gynecologic laparoscopic surgery. And this is another one of these examples where this has been this practice has been done in Europe and we're not doing it here, like the Sagamidex used in Europe but not used here, and now we, we're, this is actual practice, so it's going to be fascinating to see your, your evidence. So let's welcome Anna Spence. So I will be discussing the safety of the laryngeal mask airway, or I'll be calling it the LMA in um, gynecological laparoscopic surgery. And I became interested in this topic after doing a rotation at the surgery center where I do my clinical rotations. And um, most anesthesia providers would choose to use the LMA for most elective um, procedures, but I noticed that the laparoscopic elective gynecology procedures were always using an endotracheal tube, which is not surprising because that is simply just the standard of care. Um, it is a secured airway and the LMA is not considered a secured airway. But I, my question was, um, what is the evidence uh, dictating that the LMA is in fact uh, not safe for these types of procedures? I didn't really know if the LMA could be used with laparoscopic surgery at this point, and I didn't actually know that in Europe most practitioners choose to use the LMA for pretty much almost not, I don't want to say all, but a lot of laparoscopic procedures are done with an LMA over in Europe. So anyway, uh, background is um, the LMA is a popular airway device, airway management device used during routine surgical procedures. Um, a meta-analysis conducted by Bermacombe in 1995 found that the LMA demonstrated benefits in several areas over the endotracheal tube, including increased speed and reliability of placement, hemodynamic stability at induction of anesthesia and emergence, decreased incidence of coughing during emergence, and lower incidence of post-operative sore throat and voice alterations. So like I said, outside of the US, the LMA is used for airway management during general anesthesia for elective gynecological laparoscopy. But in the United States, the use of the LMA in these types of procedures remains controversial, and the airway management during laparoscopy is conducted with an endotracheal tube. And the reason for this is because um, 
anesthesia providers choose the endotracheal tube if positive pressure ventilation or controlled ventilation with muscle relaxation is required, which is common practice during laparoscopy because respiration is compromised by elevation of the diaphragm and absorption of CO2 caused by the pneumoperitoneum and oscillothotomy head down positioning, um, which is the positioning they use for these procedures. Concerns that have contributed to this practice of using the endotracheal tube include that the LMA does not adequately protect the airway from pulmonary aspiration of regurgitated gastric contents, and that gynecologic laparoscopy may increase the risk of aspiration due to the increased intra-abdominal pressure created by uh, the pneumoperitoneum and lithotomy head down positioning. So my purpose statement is the safety, um, the safety concern of the LMA use remains uh, the risk of aspiration and is unclear if this is indeed a greater risk with the LMA in this patient population. The purpose of this presentation is to present the evidence on the safety of the LMA compared to the endotracheal tube during laparoscopic gynecological surgery. So my PICO statement is, do patients undergoing elective laparoscopic gynecological surgery with an LMA compared to similar patients with an endotracheal tube have a higher incidence of aspiration during the perioperative period? Keywords from the PICO question were used to guide the literature search and include laryngeal mask airway, women, gynecological laparoscopy, aspiration, positive pressure ventilation, and endotracheal tube. Synonyms used to expand the search include female for women, laparoscopic surgery for gynecological laparoscopy, regurgitation, gastric inflation, and gastroesophageal reflux for aspiration. Um, the, since these were some of the key terms that came up in my search that were kind of interchangeable with aspiration. Um, controlled ventilation for positive pressure ventilation, just to get, get everything in there, and um, endotracheal tube, intubation for endotracheal tube. And abbreviations for endotracheal tube and laryngeal mask airway were also used in the search. I used PubMed, Cochrane Library, Cumulative Index to Nursing Allied, Health Literature or CINAHL, and Web of Science. Uh, the first study I looked at took place in Italy. It was conducted by Bernardini and Natalini in 2009, and they performed a retrospective analysis of prospectively collected data to compare the risk of pulmonary aspiration in patients who received mechanical ventilation via an LMA or a tracheal tube. They looked at 6, 000, I'm sorry, 65,712 procedures, which included laparoscopic oophorectomy and hysterectomy. They did not directly look at only laparoscopic gynecological surgeries. It was difficult to find four studies that only looked at this direct patient population, but this patient population was included in the study, and 861 of the cases were, that were conducted with an LMA were laparoscopic. Um, records were extracted from the database if they were collected from September 1st, 1997 to April 30th, 2008. Uh, during this time, 10 cases of pulmonary aspiration were recorded. Four occurred during elective surgery, two of which were with an LMA, and six during unplanned surgery, one was with an LMA. Six patients were admitted to the ICU after pulmonary aspiration. F sorry. Five. Um, sorry, five who underwent emergency surgery. And one of these patients had undergone elective surgery with an LMA. However, there were no reported incidents of pulmonary aspiration in the elective laparoscopic cases performed with an LMA. The authors found that the data showed that the use of the LMA did not increase the risk of incurring signs or symptoms of pulmonary aspiration compared to the tracheal tube in the study population. In conclusion, the authors found that the patients mechanically ventilated with an LMA did not have an increased risk of pulmonary aspiration compared to similar patients with an endotracheal tube, and they concluded that the use of the LMA was not associated with an increased risk of aspiration compared to the endotracheal tube. 
In the United Kingdom, in 1998, Ho, Skinner, and Majahan performed a randomized controlled trial, and this is the only randomized controlled trial that I was able to find in this topic, uh, to study whether patients receiving intermittent positive pressure ventilation with an LMA during general anesthesia have a higher risk of gastroesophageal reflux when compared to similar patients with a tracheal tube undergoing same-day gynecological laparoscopy in the head down position. Proce procedures um, in the study included gynecological diagnostic laparoscopy and laparoscopic sterilization procedures. In the study of 60 patients, ASA grade one to two, a pH electrode was used to measure pH levels in the mid-esophagus continuously throughout the operation to determine the presence of gastroesophageal reflux. Patients were randomly allocated to receive either the LMA or cuffed endotracheal tube under standardized anesthesia with positive pressure ventilation. The anesthetist was blinded to the pH measurements and the investigator was blinded to the anesthetic technique. During the study, there was no clinical evidence of regurgitation in the LMA or the tracheal tube group. Using continuous esophageal pH monitoring, four patients in the tracheal tube group had evidence of gastroesophageal reflux with none in the LMA group. Uh, in conclusion, the authors found that none of the patients in the LMA group had gastroesophageal reflux as measured by continuous esophageal pH monitoring, and the authors concluded that there is no evidence to suggest that using the LMA increases the risk of regurgitation in patients undergoing gynecological laparoscopy. Another United Kingdom study in 1996, Verghese and Bermacombe conducted a prospective descriptive study of LMA use looking at the safety and efficacy of LMAs when used non-conventionally, and non-conventionally just means um, in this study is positive pressure ventilation during prolonged anesthesia during laparoscopic and non-laparoscopic intra-abdominal surgery. So again, this study didn't look directly at gynecologic outpatient laparoscopy, but they, these patients were included in this study. And this was a two-year study, 39,824 patients who underwent general anesthesia, of which 11,910 patients were managed with an LMA. 95 of the non-conventional uses, 95% were gynecology and included 1,469 laparoscopic procedures. During this study, the authors recorded specific critical incidences that happened during the anesthetic in patients managed with an LMA. There was a total of 44 critical incidents, of which 18 were related to the airway. The critical incidents associated with the airway were regurgitation, vomiting, aspiration of gastric contents, laryngospasm, bronchospasm, and gastric dilation. There were four incidents of regurgitation, two incidents of vomiting, and one incidence of aspiration of gastric contents. Of these critical airway incidences that I just mentioned, the patient who aspirated and had an adverse outcome was not a laparoscopic case, nor was it a gynecological case. Um, it was actually just an elective um, excision of a lipoma. Um, so in conclusion, the authors found no significant difference in patients undergoing positive pressure ventilation with an LMA compared to spontaneous ventilation with an LMA, and concluded that use of the LMA for gynecologic lapar laparoscopy appears safe and may have a role in gynecologic laparoscopy. Another United Kingdom study in 1997 study the incidence of regurgitation in 100 patients, ASA 1 to 2, undergoing elective gynecological laparoscopies with general anesthesia and positive pressure ventilation using an LMA. These patients swallowed a gelatin capsule containing 10 milligrams of methylene blue. A pH electrode was passed and measurements recorded every six seconds. Methylene blue staining of the oropharynx was not seen on visual inspection in any patient prior to induction. Staining of the larynx with methylene blue after induction and placement of the LMA did not occur in 99 patients. In one patient, blue dye in the laryngopharynx was seen on fiber optic examination immediately after induction. There was no contamination of the trachea and anesthesia proceeded uneventfully for this patient. Postoperative fiber, op fiber 
optic examination showed a blue stain, but to a lesser extent, and the perioperative pH did not decrease to less than four, and that was our threshold for uh, saying the patient, did I do something? Thanks. For saying the pa whether the patient had a uh, reflux or not. So 30 patients were then randomly selected for fiber optic examination of the laryngopharynx after laparoscopy. None of these patients showed any evidence of regurgitation. The authors say their overall incidence of regurgitation was 0 and 91. Actually, now that I see that, I don't know what happened. I think, I can't remember, nine of the patients may have been discluded from the study. I'm sorry, I can't remember exactly what happened with the other nine patients. It was 100 patients. Um, sorry about that. Uh, the authors found that none of the patients in whom fiber optic examination of the laryngopharynx was performed after laparoscopy showed any evidence of regurgitation. The authors concluded that the incidence of regurgitation with an LMA during laparoscopic surgery is extremely low. So the clinical implications is that the evidence shows that female patients undergoing elective laparoscopic gynecological surgery do not have a higher incidence of aspiration when an LMA is used for airway management compared to similar patients with an endotracheal tube. And based on these findings, it is probably controversial, but uh, it is recommended as a safe alternative to the endotracheal tube during short outpatient laparoscopic. Thank you. Thank you, Anna, for taking on a controversial topic. Yes. Yeah. Right. Right. I mean, here's the evidence. Um, is this, is this, has, has, let me ask it first, and I'll ask you, has practice changed out there yet? Not as far as I know. No. No? It was not a question. If it was laparoscopic, you, it was an endotracheal tube. No questions asked. No questions asked. Yeah. A laparoscopic mm -hmm. um, gets an endotracheal tube. Correct. Right, right. What do you think that's all about? Okay, here we have our wise folks back here. I'm going to go to this table first, okay? Did you have a comment? No. Nice job, Anna. Thanks. Um, did they talk about, to kind of go to your question, Jane, did they talk about why? Um, it's used so often in Europe and not in the United States? Why the LMA is used so often? Right. Um, I, they didn't necessarily discuss, I guess mostly because of the decrease, like, you know, it's just easier insertion for the LMA, emergence is smoother, less voice complications, um, just the overall safety profile of the LMA in general for elective surgery. I guess they translate that. Was there any mention of lawsuits in Europe related to an LMA and laparoscopic procedures versus the United States? I did not read anything about litigation. I researched a lot of information about this topic, including I didn't, there's a huge body of literature that says that the LMA can be used with laparoscopic surgery. So, and there wasn't any mention of litigation in that or any of these studies at all. I'm just wondering if there are less lawsuits in Europe, which is why well, practitioners yeah. feel comfortable. I mean, in the evidence that you're presenting says that it is safe, but because people are so sue happy in the United States, they don't want to even take the risk. Correct. I, I think that that's probably a major obstacle to using, beginning to use LMA over here in the United oh. States. I agree with you. But I think it's going to be very challenging even presenting the evidence to get people to change practice. Right. Because people are so set that if you're having a laparoscopic procedure, you get an ET tube, an LMA. There's absolutely no way. I mean, even just... I spoke for Baxter on Desflurane, and there was um, controversy, controversy about using an LMA with, a, with Desflurane. Mm -hmm. And the studies show that you can use Des with an LMA, but Baxter spent, I don't know how many thousands of dollars trying to get that word out to change practice, and people didn't want to hear it. Right. right. Airway irritability and potential laryngospasm but with desflurane because you're using LMA so you don't you don't have a secure airway
but because desflurane can be an airway irritant well, and good. right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, good job, Anna. Uh, two thoughts. The one to follow up with Dr. Bennett's thought. The, the, the practice environment is very different with uh, socialized medicine in, in the UK and mm -hmm. uh, also it's the home of Archie Brain, of course, yes. who developed the LMA and, and they there is rumor that they even they use LMA for thoracotomy over there. So I mean, I they, be surprised. lateral and prone cases and what have you that, that we don't do it. We're just not that bold. Right. Um, but also to follow up on the uh, looking at some of your early articles, um, I would guess that that would be the LMA classic they were talking about. They were yes. Citing. So actually, it's interesting that you say that because none of the studies delineated which type of LMA they were using, except for one. One of them did, and it was the classic LMA. Okay. So how do you think things will change now with the new families of, of uh, superglottic airway devices? Well, I really do think that we should conduct more studies with the LMA Supreme versus, their, versus the classic. I think that would be important to build upon this body of research that says we can use the LMA because that's what the LMA Supreme is used for a higher risk, you know, group of people. And you can use um, higher peak airway pressures, et cetera. So it would definitely be safer for this population as opposed to the classic LMA. But the issue, the, the looking at it to me more logically, more studies, we already have studies. I mean, what are more studies gonna do? But, and the other point I wanted to say about your four studies, the last two were done 20 years ago, 1996 and 1997, and probably we're, I think anesthesia providers are aware of that, aren't they? Don't you think? That, that not only that it's being used in Europe on this patient population, but there are studies to show that 20 years ago that it's been, that it's effective or safe. And yet, um, it doesn't change our practice. I think the problem, not, I mean, one of the problems I found with the literature that I found is that there were a lot of studies, but not a lot of them looked directly at aspiration. Mm. A lot of them looked at uh, oropharyngeal leak pressures and gastric insufflation and other things, nausea and vomiting and other things that, okay, maybe that's a downfall, but really, so I can have a no oral pharyngeal leak pressure or I'm not gonna have gastric insufflation, but if I'm gonna aspirate, then they didn't really look at, yes, I, I understand those things go together with aspiration, but still, they didn't look at aspiration. That was kind of just a side well, comment in some of these other articles that I, that I read that were comparing different LMAs. Do you so. think, though, the reason they didn't look at aspiration because there wasn't any aspiration? It's possible, yeah. I would think, because I think they were measuring these other things like the pH and the methylene blue to sort of, it's sort of a, mo a finer monet measurement mm -hmm. than aspiration. Um, um, and the other point, those 96 study anyway, those are, that was really, it wasn't a random, it didn't compare LMAs right. to ETs. It was a descriptive study. Right. But of thousands of patients showing a very, very minuscule incidence right. of, of, error, of, of problem. Yeah, I mean, it, the Which was evidently show. good enough for the people in Europe to right. go ahead and use this. I think people in the US are gonna be looking for more concrete stuff, that's just my opinion, but. That's what you, you think maybe there is, it would help to do another couple of RCTs? I do think Comparing so. LMAs to ET tubes? I think so. With this know. patient population? Yeah. Okay, well, okay, any other questions, comments? Yes, we've got one here. Thank you, Anna, I enjoy okay. your presentation. Um, with the LMA, are they suggesting a longer fasting period? No, not that I'm aware of, no. Okay. Yeah, I, I think that's a good question. Is there any difference between, I mean, except we keep our patients NPO after midnight a long, long time, but do, does Europe do that um, any differently? 
No, it didn't seem like it. And in fact, they use the same exclusion criteria as that, we do here. Uh -huh. For like, they would just you know they. I didn't mention the exclusion criteria, but it was you know GERD and hiatal hernia, morbid obesity, morbid things obesity. that we don't also use LMA for. Right. So right. Uh huh. Okay. Let's give Anna another hand. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good job. Good job. And our last speaker today, Grinelda Placu. Okay. But, you know, I think this was a great example of, we think if we get evidence that will change our practice, and, we, and we, it doesn't. And maybe we really need to identify what are the barriers. Is it, I think you bring up a good, Point there is it because we're more Sioux conscious? But, um, she said that what was it? Seventy countries, twenty countries, something like that, are using this LMA. Cost? What the? E Wait a minute. What would be cheaper? LMA. Is an LMA a cheaper anesthetic than an ET tube? It is. Would you say that? Because you're not. Yeah. Mm hmm. So an ET tube anesthetic is less expensive. No. Okay, LMAs would be cheaper. Okay, LMAs would be cheaper, a cheaper anesthetic. And maybe that's what they're looking at. They're more willing. But there's no risk here. Any, anyway, it's an interesting dilemma to look at. We think that if we've got evidence, it would change practice. But here's one that just hasn't yet. So our last speaker today is Brunilda Placu. Brunilda was born in a small country in Europe, Albania. She graduated from middle school in her home country, and in 1999, she moved to Greece, and that's where she graduated from high school. In 03, her family moved here to the US, and she graduated with a nursing degree from Temple in 09. She worked for four years in the ICU at Einstein Medical Center, where she learned how to become a compassionate and dedicated nurse. In 14, she started pursuing her degree in anesthesia here at Drexel and um, will graduate in May. And she's married and has a three-year-old daughter. And so today she's going to talk to us about, again, regional anesthesia with dexamethasone reducing post-operative pain. So let's welcome Bernilda Placu from Albania. So thank you, everyone. Um, the topic that I was interested in searching for um, this project was the effectiveness of regional anesthesia with dexamethasone on reducing postoperative pain. Uh, in my clinical practice, I had seen um, different anesthesia providers choose uh, to use dexamethasone as an adjunct to the local anesthetic to um, improve postoperative pain and motor blockade. So um, peripheral nerve blocks are used to provide intraoperative and postoperative analgesia. Some types of peripheral nerve blocks include um, cervical blocks, uh, interscalene, supraclavicular, popliteal, femoral, and femoral blocks. Um, peripheral nerve blockade is often used for upper and lower limb surgery. It is the preferred type of anesthesia for outpatient surgeries, and it's frequently used for orthopedic surgeries. Patients who receive peripheral nerve blockade compared to general anesthesia alone have less postoperative uh, pain, less nausea and vomiting, shorter length of stay in postoperative care unit, and greater patient uh, satisfaction. Satisfaction. The length and duration of peripheral nerve blockade depends on the type and dose of local anesthetic used. The local anesthetic uh, provides analgesia, but duration of pain is uh, limited uh, to the duration of local anesthetic. 
After local anesthetics has worn off, the patient experiencing pain and requires uh, narcotic drugs for pain relief. Um, the use of, of narcotic drugs results in complications such as respiratory depression, uh, nausea and vomiting, uh, constipation, and pruritus. Providing postoperative pain relief with peripheral nerve blockades leads to early mobilization, shortened length of stay, reduced hospital cost, and as I said, uh, increased uh, patient satisfaction. Um, traditionally, the use of epinephrine um, addition to the local anesthetic has, has been used to prolong the peripheral nerve blockade. As we all know, um, well, as we, uh, the anesthesia providers know, epinephrine causes vasoconstriction at the site of injection and decreases the rate of systemic absorption and lengthens the analgesia time. Opioids have also been used as adjunct to the peripheral nerve blockade. Um, uh, opioids have a direct action on spinal cord opioid receptor um, and prolong the peripheral nerve blockade. The addition of the drug dexamethasone, which is a systemic glucocorticoid drug, uh, to, the addition, to the local anesthetic drug for peripheral nerve blockade has been used to increase the duration of local anesthetic and reduce post-op pain. A non-clinical study done in mouse nerve block model by N et al. 2015 found that dexamethasone, when added to the local anesthetic drug, a sciatic, um, during a sciatic peripheral nerve block, um, increased the duration of thermal antinociception and lead, led to prevention of rebound hyperalgesia. It is unclear if dexamethasone would add it to local anesthetic for peripheral nerve blocks, prolongs the duration of local anesthetic and decreases postoperative pain. So the purpose of this study was to describe the effectiveness of dexamethasone on prolongation of peripheral nerve blockade and a reduction of postoperative pain in surgical patients. My pick up question um, was as follows. Do surgical patients uh, who receive peripheral nerve block anesthesia with local anesthetic with dexamethasone compared to similar patients who do not receive dexamethasone with a local anesthetic have a prolonged block and less postoperative pain? To search for literature, um, the Cumulative Index of Nursing and Allied Health uh, Literature, uh, PubMed, Cochrane, and Web of Science databases were uh, searched. The keywords that I used uh, included neuroxal anesthesia, dexamethasone, regional anesthesia, peripheral nerve block, prolonged block, and postoperative pain relief. The first study that um, I looked into was from Choi et al. 2014. It was a level one evidence study. Um, Choi et al. concluded a systemic review and meta-analysis uh, of nine randomized clinical trials. It included 801 patients. Uh, 393 patients received four to 10 milligrams of dexamethasone, and the rest of uh, the patient did, just uh, received the local anesthetic. And from their um, study, um, uh, they found that the prolongation of duration of analgesia uh, was from 730 minutes with just local anesthetic to um, 1,306 minutes with uh, addition of dexamethasone to the local anesthetic. Also, they, also uh, they found that motor blockade was pro prolonged from 664 minutes to 1,102 minutes with the addition of the dexamethasone. Han et al. 2015, uh, this was also a level one evidence. They performed a systematic review and meta-analysis of 12 clinical trials. Um, the study included 1,054 patients. Uh, from those patients, 512 received the perineural dexamethasone uh, with the local anesthetic. The study found that um, the duration of analgesia was increased from 325 minutes to 351 minutes, and the duration of motor blockade was increased from a median of 202 minutes to 278 minutes. So the duration of uh, analgesia during the study was defined as the time uh, 
uh, from the time that the local anesthetic was uh, with the dexamethasone was administered until the time that the first um, uh, post-operative analgesic was administered. Coenishi et al. 2014, this was a level two evidence. It included nine uh, prospective randomized clinical trials. Uh, it included 39 patients. Uh, in this study, uh, they had three groups. Um, the first group um, only received the local anesthetic, and then in this case was the ropivacaine 0.75%. Uh, the second group received the local anesthetic drug ropivacaine 0.75%, plus the perineural dexamethasone and the dose was four milligrams of the dexamethasone. And the third group um, received the ropivacaine, 0.75% plus uh, IV dexamethasone instead of the perineural dexamethasone. Um, this study found that the uh, group with perineural dexamethasone um, had longer um, analgesia, so the median was 18 hours compared to 11.2 hours uh, from the group that only had, um, that, from the group that did not have the dexamethasone. And the median duration of analgesia in the group that um, had the IV uh, administration of dexamethasone was 14 hours. Kumar et al. 2014, um, this was a level two evidence. Um, it was a randomized prospective do double blind clinical trial um, of 80 patients. They also measured duration of analgesia from the onset of sensory block to the reappearance of pain. Um, they found that the mean duration of analgesia was longer in the, in the dexamethasone group uh, from um, 557 minutes from just patients receiving just the local anesthetic to uh, 1,179 minutes um, with patients that had uh, the local anesthetic in uh, conjunction with the dexamethasone. So um, all the studies um, measured the effectiveness of dexamethasone as adjunct to peripheral nerve blocks. They all found that peripheral dexamethasone it significantly improved postoperative analgesia. Um, the limitations that I found uh, just looking through the li uh, literature include that um, all these studies, um, they all, uh, the uh, researchers only included studies that had uh, um, uh, surgeries that had uh, upper extremity blocks, um, and uh, they, such as bra brachial plexus block, interscaling, and supraclavicular. I did not see any studies that uh, included lower extremity blocks, such as femoral of, uh, or sciatic. Uh, nerve blocks. Um, and also another limitation uh, that I found was that uh, there was not, a, across the studies, there was not a s um, specific dose of um, a perineural dexamethasone used, uh, but there was a wide range from 4 milligrams to 10 milligrams. So clinical uh, implications, um, it's, it's clear that the evidence shows that adding dexamethasone to the local anesthetic drug for peripheral nerve blocks will increase the duration of block and improve postoperative pain. So based on these findings, it is recommended that clinicians um, use dexamethasone um, as an adjunct to local anesthetic drug for peripheral no nerve blocks. This practice uh, would improve patient's recovery time and increase patient satisfaction rates. Um, to implement this practice, um, a plan needs to be um, in place. Um, as, as usual with uh, change in practice, um, there are um, challenges, uh, but um, I believe that with um, advocate education and encouragement, um, this uh, practice, changing practice can be implemented. Okay, thank you, Bernardo. Thank Let's you. give her a hand. All right. Okay. So any questions? Is anyone using this, seen this used in practice? Dexamethasone added to your regional anesthetic to prolong the block? Yes. Has anyone seen it? Yes? You're using it? A couple of the anesthesiologists like it. Do you have a Oh, hello. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, oh, sorry. Again, I think it's like practitioner dependent. There's a couple anesthesiologists that use it on a routine basis, and then a couple others that just don't like to use it. Is it just upper extremity blocks? I've only seen it in upper extremities, in I believe. Upper. Anybody know the reason why it's only upper extremity? Would it be that it's dose limited? Like you said, the dose range the is dose four to is ten. F between four and ten. Ten milligrams. milligrams. Um, yeah, I, I did not see any studies that included lower extremity blocks. Um, I so wonder I'm why. Sure. Mm. I'm not sure why. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Um, do you, when you look at the times. Like the first study, it only increased it by 20 minutes from my calculation. Okay. Or maybe, and it increased, or let me see, the first one increased motor Se block. The first one was from 730 minutes to 1,300 minutes. Okay, that's minutes. about 400 minutes, yeah. which is four hours, or three, or just five hours or something. Okay. There was one that was like one hour. If it was, okay. there was motor. Then this, the other one was seven hours. I think another one was six hours. Mm -hmm. Do you think, and I want to ask out here, you also, yes. um, is, is six hours, is that a significant amount of prolongation of, for your um, analgesia? Or your, what would you call it, local, local anesthesia? Right. Six hours is a, is a significant amount of time um, after having your surgery. You know, just having less pain, you you could take deeper breaths. You can uh, ambulate earlier. So I mm -hmm. believe that the uh, and there are no risks. I didn't find any risks with using uh, dexamethasone perineurally. So. Considering the risks and benefits, I would think that adding the dexamethasone with a, doesn't have any complications perineurally, so why not? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I was thinking that we, that the blocks in the pain clinic, right? When we do blocks in the pain clinic, they, they uh, use a local anesthetic mm -hmm. and something like decadron or dexamethasone, right? And maybe that's where this idea came from. I don't know. Uh, my idea was just because I had seen it in practice. You've seen it. I had seen only uh, specific providers use it and not others. So I, w I was wondering why not. You've seen the only use of dexamethasone. Who? Only who? Only, only what kind? certain providers. Certain providers. Right. Anesthesiologists. Anesthesiologists. Uh huh. Maybe they it. came. Maybe they came from the pain clinic. I well, um, when I asked the question, they said that they had been reading literature and he was okay. showing that uh, it made it, a difference it, it made a difference so that's why they chose to use okay. it and the the side effects uh, there are no side effects mm -hmm. of using mm -hmm. it so why not the only thing is you have to use a dexamethasone preservative free preservative. when you use it perineural uh-huh uh-huh any any other comments Yes, nice job, Brunella. Uh, I would think that an exclusion criteria may be diabetes mellitus. Can you speak to that? Hmm, maybe. <laughs> That's a good, good point, good point. Because, why? Increase in the blood sugar. Like if you're a diabetic and you have a glucocorticoid, you can increase your mm -hmm. blood sugar. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But maybe we can use into, let's say, we can exclude the diabetic patients from having the dexamethasone yeah. with uh, the original block. Right. Well, it's interesting that you had prolongation with um, IV as well. Um, it was minimal, though. It wasn't as, as significant. And of course, dexamethasone in many practice sites is part and parcel of the preemptive, you know, POND uh, armamentarium. So mm -hmm. they may be providing you know, four to 10 milligrams anyway. Sure. But I, I do know that uh, our patient blood sugars real post-operatively when they receive Decadron if they're uh, type two diabetic. Mm -hmm. That you see an elevated blood glucose when they're yes. given that de dexamethasone, uh-huh. But IV, 
And we don't know I if think. we if we don't know if we see it with the block. It yeah, we don't know. No. It would be that's yeah, it'd be something yeah. we want to keep an eye on. Yeah. I don't know if any of the studies looked at that. I yeah. did not come across. But that's Brunhilde's next project, I believe. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Sure. That'll be the next question to answer. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Well, let's give Brunilda a hand. Good job. Thank you. Thank you for wrapping us up. And believe it or not, we are done. We're done early. But before we end, Dr. Holt is going to give us some closing remarks. And I want you'll ask them all, don't run away, you presenters, OK? We need a picture. <laughs> Thank you all very, very, very much for coming. I know it's not only coming that I'm thanking you for, but taking the time to, to, to listen to your instructor first. You probably said, you have a really good project. Please consider submitting it to the colloquium and then you said oh do I really have to do the extra work and you got some help and you did it so as one faculty member to students thank you very much for doing that those of you that are online thank you very much for participating I'm sorry that you didn't get to see the posters during the break but we have one more poster session and Dr. McCarthy is going to come over with some poster presenters and talk to you uh, online and share some of the posters with you Yes. yes, yes. And so while they're getting together to do that, because we don't want you to miss out on that, we, are, we have pictures, the PDFs of the posters, because we don't want to leave you out. You are very important. And those are going to be available on the online link. So those of you that are here in person um, and want to see the posters again, or those of you online and want to see them for the first time at your leisure, they will be available probably uh, Rob Raspberry's group tells me it might take them three to four days to get them up on the link. So the link, if you registered, you have in your email. So go back to that link and you'll be able to see that on YouTube as a one-way stream. Those of you who didn't register, I do encourage you to because an unexpected benefit that we just found out this morning is if you did register and if you didn't, if you go outside and sign your name, that will register you. You will get uh, five contact hours for today. Um, after the colloquium is over, so maybe before you take a second look at the posters, if you would come up here if you were a presenter, a poster presenter or an oral presenter, so that we can get a picture. Again, I thank all of the faculty that are here. Many have already gone. And those of you who don't know, we do have some undergrad students who, were a, who presented at the colloquium. So we thank you for participating this year as well. It's your first time in the colloquiums. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Bennett, Dr. Kelly, thank you both for being here. Please come up for the picture so we can put you in the chartings as well. And Dr. McCarthy, Dr. Poise manned our booth today, but she had to run out now. So thank you all very much. Last minute housekeeping detail. Looking forward to next year. We're going to have two colloquiums next year. One is going to be a professional colloquium, and one is going to be a student colloquium. This one would be the student colloquium venue. What we're doing is our uh, PA program is going to head up what we have been doing in our professional program. And this year, they're having their first trial run of an evidence-based practice workshop. It's going to be over two days, May 6th and 7th. It is a registered event. It's it's going to take place at the Academy, right? And there's going to be a reception on Friday night, and then during the two days of, the, of their event workshop, you'll have some hands-on experience in finding literature, appraising literature, and then figuring out if it's implementable, and if so, how do you do that? So the how-tos are going to come May 6th and 7th this year. Next year, look for two colloquiums. Thank you very much for your support. and. Please do take advantage of our posters. Those of you who are presenters, if you'll please come join us up here so we can take a picture. Thank you very much for coming.